I would like to call the Rocky Mountain City Council Committee of the whole meeting to order. First of all, I'd like to say Happy New Year to everyone. Hope everyone had a Happy New Year. Hope everyone is ready to jump in the saddle and let's grind. And let's get some things done for our citizens here in, in Rocky Mountain. First of all, I would like to welcome all of our citizens and our guests to the meeting. And this meeting is designed as a work session for the council members to receive, review, and discuss information prepared by staff. Only staff and council members are allowed to speak during the meeting without special permission. At this time, I'll ask our city manager uh, if she would, uh, well, the first thing about on our agenda is real estate attorney client uh, privilege. Thank and that's a closed session. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, and happy New Year again to everyone. I'd like to start the meeting um, in a closed session. So we need a motion. Uh, is there a motion? Mm -hmm. motion? Motion made by Councilwoman Miller, second by Council Member Blackwell. All in favor, let me know by the vote is aye. Aye. Opposed nay. We are now in closed session. I'm going to ask if you are not part of staff, um, please exit the room. And we will notify you when you come back. All right, so um, we're going to try to concisely cover what is a uh, very technical process. Um, but to try to give you an idea of where we are, the current agent position is, where we're going to be involved with rehabilitation of the So um, just a little background on what the current roadway maintenance funding is. Um, streets and right-of-way operating budget, $1.32 million. This does not include, um, this does not include the, um, street, the, the stormwater budget. Um, this is just the uh, general fund portion of the budget. And that goes towards current better player um, street. Um, so that, we'll go with this anyway. Um, So it goes to curb gun repair, patching, mowing, um, loose leaf collection, snow and ice removal. Uh, the resurfacing budget, um, shore operations budget is three, uh, three point four million dollars. Does not go towards regular maintenance other than the storm drainage infrastructure. Uh, resurfacing is uh, um, generally paid for by the Powell allocation. Powell allocation currently five point one uh, million, uh, one point five million dollars, uh, and then supplemented. A few years ago, by 800,000 in the vehicle permit fees, which is dedicated just to resource. Um, the balance of that allocation um, and we program 1.6 million dollars a year for the resource. Now that fluctuates between a little over 1.6 and somewhere under uh, 1.6, but on average, that's what we're putting in the budget, and that's about what we're spending. Um, the balance of that budget goes towards NCDOT match for pedestrian hazard, all the sidewalk that's going on for the lightweight uh, lighting projects, um, the match on the uh, uh, safe routes to school sidewalk project, uh, clean water management trust fund projects, those kind of things, engineering, spot safety, signal enhancement, roadway improvements, wait time, that new construction stuff uh, generally comes out of this budget. All right, um, so. 2018, we conducted actual on-the-ground survey. Teams from Kersher and Exepi came in, uh, rode every single street, took a look at um, what kind of fatigue cracking we had, what kind of failures we had in the pavement, quantified that, uh, and then loaded it in uh, to uh, my software to analyze. If anybody's interested, these are the, the uh, type of distresses that we took a look at. All right. So general findings, um, Rocky Mount has uh, 4.3 million square yards of street, three point, uh, at value of three, thirty-one dollars and sixty cents a square yard, gives us a total roadway asset of 137 million. Uh, overall um, condition index, uh, 69.4, uh, 
looking at um, as generally considered a fair rating, uh, and you see some um, equivalencies in these other cities in this time where we did rating. So we're generally in that range, better than some, not as good, uh, uh, better than a lot, but not as good as that. Um, that's uh, 4.3 million square miles equates to 276 miles of paved street, 555 mile of lane miles. So if you have a two lane road, that's a, uh, two, uh, two lane miles for each uh, lane mile for each side of the street, four lane road, four times the, the mile of the street. All right, so um, this is the initial backlog. So once they looked at all the distresses uh, and, and figured out what work needed to be done, they determined that we essentially have uh, 450 miles that need work, some kind of maintenance, and the value of that backlog of work is $38 million. So this just breaks it down um, by county and by ward. We'll see generally roughly equivalent. Um, ward 7 is a little bit higher than everybody else, and that's because um, there were some really bad conditions in North Green where we did some of that FDR work to begin with. Um, so that bumped the bump. And they also have um, some of the lowest lane miles uh, in the ward. So uh, that, that kind of bumped them up a little bit. All right. So what they did to, to figure out what work we needed to do was use a tool called um, uh, Agile Assets um, Payment. Um, and payment analyst module. It's the same stuff that DOT uses, lots of other municipalities and jurisdictions that do railway maintenance across the, uh, across the nation use to try to figure out what kind of improvements need to be done and when to, to place them down. So the goal uh, of this effort is to try to get the right treatment at the right time to get the maximum length, uh, life out of that payment. So the first thing you want to do is try to come in here and do basic maintenance with um, low level maintenance, practicing and those kind of things, that pushes the life out a little bit further. Then you go in and do what we're talking about, microsurfacing, that pushes the life a little further. And then finally, you get to the most expensive part of it, which is overlay. And what you kind of do is do that maintenance on the front end to have that overlay as late as possible and try to keep doing those lower cost um, items as soon as we can. So that's optimizing your investment. If you miss these steps along the way, then the condition, just like your house, if you don't paint your house, it starts to deteriorate rapidly. So what you want to do is try to do these maintenance steps before it starts falling off the cliff to kind of keep it, keep it going. So this software tries to go through and look at those segments and say, this is what you need to do with it to, opt, to be optimally maximize your investment. So the menu of things that we have on our that we can <coughs> Maximum we do all the time. We're actually starting maximum. After you do that, we want to step up our game on that and do that a little bit more better. Rejuvenation um, is um, something that we've not done before, but uh, we will be trying to take a look at, but it's not part of our work program. We'll do some pilot stuff for that. Microservicing, this is a new one for us this time. We'll take a look at that. We've done it in Nashville, we've done it all over um, the state, in the East Coast. Um, it's essentially a slurry seal with some thick um, this is ideal for stuff that's kind of oxidized pavement, but <coughs> structurally good. Uh, and that'll give us five, seven more years of life out of that pavement before we move good to the next step. And potentially we can microsurf it a couple of times. Is that what just happened on Sunset? No. Microsurf? Microsurfers. No. The, 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 this is really applies to local roads. I know, but the same type of what I'm saying on microsurfacing is that uh, see, Sunset, they did mill and fill. That's, the, that's this one right here. So they've done that on Grand, just did that on Grand Avenue. I think they're mill and fill on Sunset. They did a bunch of milling projects in this last day. And so that's this one. So this is traditionally what we've done, is crack seal, overlay, mill, overlay. And then when the streets are really bad, we started FDR about 10 years ago, which is full depth reclamation. That got our cost for reconstruction way down. Um, but ideally, we never get to this step if we can do these other ones at the right time. Fortunately, um, you need to, that takes a lot of money. All right. So when we went through the scenarios to evaluate options, we looked at 
what, what will they uh, worse first? What, what they want, will they optimize by the software 2.4 optimized? What it would take to maintain the PCI, the current condition at roughly seven, and then what it would take to improve the overall road condition, which is about 4, 2, 4, 2, 5 billion. Council Member Blackway, that's a question. Yes. Is this all activity that we can do in house with our own team? So when you're doing the estimates, that factors our labor costs too, or is this to be contracted out, or is this some hybrid? Um, the patching, some of that we can do in house. Uh, but not all of it um, in terms of volume of, of it, but some of that we can do in-house, and we're doing in-house for cuts and those kind of things. But when we're looking to try to do something more than the, the jump and go that we've been doing, um, which would be something short of resurfacing, um, but that would extend those life. So if you have a weak spot, it's otherwise good, we can go in with our forces, cut that spot out, the rest of the road is pretty good. When you got widespread failures, then it's off to the other tree. So we are looking at that, that the actual resurfacing, microsurfacing, that specialty stuff, we don't have the resources manpower. So that's, Barnhill has had our resurfacing contract every year since I've been here. We only had one competitive bid one time and then we're going to close. So. Yes, sir. Kip, do that. that you have the same estimation in, or some uh, some not on the dirt roads that still in the real world. That's the next presentation. All right, so, so this is just looking at various scenarios. Um, what we're roughly studying now, uh, we use 1.4, even though we're doing 1.6 for inflation, and give us some room to move around um, from year to year. So this is just for the month. Um, so so <coughs> you see, um, at 1.4 million optimized investment, um, we're not even catching up with the backlog. We're still losing around. So, because stuff ages, as it ages, it declines, and you got to have a certain level of maintenance just to keep it. So, we lose a ground on the back one. And then you start catching up once we get to 2.5 uh, million a year, those kind of things. So, this is just an estimated backlog uh, based on those various investments. This just really quick tells you 2019, 69, uh, PCI 6519 right here. Uh, investment uh, 3.5 million is the maintaining curve, so that's this red line. This is the degradation curve. Uh, investing in the existing allocation to the worst first. So if we just say we're not going to worry about the other stuff, we're just going to fix the stuff that's the worst. That actually ends up way down here at 50 PCI in 10 years. So unfortunately, we can't, if we go do the worst first with the investment level we have now, we're just going to keep losing ground. So Technically, we would never catch up with the backlog that we have and the amount of money that we're being funded. So we're going to have to look at uh, maybe a, a, a bond referendum along with our housing bond if we want to have good paved streets and roads that we travel. And just before you get into your dirt street presentation, mm -hmm. that next? Yes. Okay. Uh, Blackwell is the longest seating, not the oldest council member. But that was one of Helen Gay's uh, main initiatives. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we have had this presentation uh, several times in our city council retreat. And from our neighborhood association meeting, community meetings, uh, the dirt streets uh, have come up. Uh, several times, and so we asked staff if they would bring that back to us. But just a little backdrop on the dirt street and how it would happen. But, but the other part of that, okay. may I? Yes. The other part of that story is that dirt street of paving was shelved in order to focus on getting sidewalks in. Right. And you go. So. So. Yeah, well, I didn't know if you'd come to the end of your so I had a quick question, yeah. particularly in the context of a bond referendum. I saw that you were measuring return on investment, and so what's the formula that you use for that to anticipate any uh, borrowed money, which is really what a bond is? Uh, really, they were just looking at return on investment in terms of how much you would save versus the lose. Based so on the depreciation, the actual yeah. depreciation yeah. and the yeah. cost, yeah. replacement yeah. cost. Yeah. Okay. And I, I do want to ask um, how we evaluate internal capacity versus um, contracting right. out uh, what we do. And 
is there any way to build our own capacity to do more in the continuum of uh, road maintenance or street maintenance? There is for the operational side of it, but not for the resurfacing and those kind of things, because that's a major capital investment. That's a bar hill, SD route. Nobody in the state, the DOT doesn't do that in-house, the resurfacing. That, that is a contracted service, and nobody in the nation does that internal, other than small pavement. Now, we have a small pavement for small patches doing minor paving stuff, like those kinds of so things. So then that statement also leads me to wonder how do we tie this matter manager back to um, building our own supply <coughs> subcontractors at a local that could work with Barghill to ensure that whoever we <coughs> work with to ensure that we are given opportunity for broader participation in those big dollars. You say nobody could do it. That's kind of a scale. Like, and that also that calls into question from my mind about equity and opportunity for um, growth and expansion of our own business base here. I think we would have to sit down with um, all of the respondents and make sure that they're clear about what the MWD goals are, what the expectations are to um, allow for more uh, local subcontracting. And then maybe from that, and I say maybe because Obviously, this is a very specialized uh, operation. Um, that for that, perhaps a firm or a company could, could grow. Uh, I think probably the cost of the equipment alone, let alone just the expertise of the staff that will be required to run an internal uh, paving program like that would be astronomical. That's why we go to the contract, actually. But I without think. leverage to create opportunity for others. Right, I think it also that's ensures that there's a limited ability to respond to those issues and sure. challenges. So I'm just asking that the city uh, take this great opportunity to expand mm -hmm. um, and build out folks to work with to work with our great contractors that we have here. We're sure. not trying to limit anybody and just looking for expansion of opportunity. Yes. And the other thing I would say to that point is that the servicing contract includes uh, curb gutter replacement and sidewalk replacement. That's all subcontracted. They do go through the MPE process relative to those bids. Um, and I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. I think there is some participation through that already. Um, pretty sure there is, but I can't tell you through that particular sub is at the moment. And again, and I know this might be not poor, but it is poor. When you talk about multiple millions of dollars. And, and leverage coming back to your community, mm -hmm. which results in tax base revenue and expansion of your own local economy. Yeah. I think it also is a great opportunity to talk about what we can do to support the um, building of the infrastructure so that instead of having one or two, you know, we can maybe have three or four or 10 or 12 or look for some other leverage in you know, the region so that um, we're really building our own internal Perhaps. infrastructure for everybody. Well, you know, ideally, we would want that to be at the local level uh, because then the contractors are putting money back into right. our local economy. Right. When they come from other areas, uh, Greenville, Raleigh, what <coughs> have you, they take that investment and put it back in those communities. So ideally, what we want to do is grow that capacity here locally. That's, that's the ideal. And... Um, so um, we will uh, request to have a discussion about uh, MWBE uh, program participation and local, so, and local, and local, and, and local but to local yes, to because be that's inclusive. yes, yes, sir, <coughs> because that is where we really get the best for our bucks. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's important to have the MWBE participation, but it's even more ideal when that participation is grown right here, and then they are reinvesting back in the community in which they live, as opposed to going to other communities, taking the resources back to other communities. So we'll, we, we certainly plan to have that. So does that mean when you come back with your next step, you got something else that you'll be bringing us at the same time? We like to think that we can um, request that the discussion be as soon as um, 
the next committee to hold, or even uh, as Mayor Pro Tem has suggested at the council retreat, uh, have a fuller discussion about the MWB program that we have now and get guidance and direction from you as, as that program is being built. And I'd say and local small businesses, regardless yes. of their ethnicity, yes. um, gender or orientation of individuals, I think yes, looking sir. for full participation in all of that. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So uh, this is a breakdown of the four scenarios and the two additional scenarios that got us to the recommended work. So this is the full investment. You see how many lane miles here, uh, over 900 lane miles. Uh, treatments, reconstruction, rehab, preservation, rejuvenated, privacy, and passing. And that's just color coded. Kind of gives you an idea of proportion. Um, then this is the 3.5 million a year. This would be ideal. Um, if this gets better, this um, maintains, and this almost maintains. Um, and so that's up at 2.5 would be just over 600, 650 lane miles of treatment. This is worst first. So if we did it, just did the worst stuff on the list, we're way down here in terms of just over 100 lane miles uh, of treatment. Um, this is what we call the optimized model. So this model goes in and tries to push all the investment to the low cost, to extend the life um, treatments to try to do as many lane miles as possible. So optimize, this purple, this is the preservation, this is the microsurfacing that we talked about. Well, we haven't done that yet. We are not prepared to make that kind of investment in microsurfacing when we haven't done it yet. Um, so we asked the consultant to limit that, to run a model and limit that to $200,000 a year until we get comfortable with it. Um, when, how, and then how, we street, also, how, how much street does that buy you? Uh, it's on, it's on here, Mr. Mayor, I think. Um, the, uh, so, well, actually, you look at it right here. So it's about, um, at 200,000, looks like it gets us about 75, uh, 750 land miles, based on that, that graph there, somewhere right there. Um, and then we asked them to make a minimum investment into the full depth reclamation so that it doesn't push everything to that. So we pick up, which is what we've been doing. We've been doing overlays. And we take a certain portion and we're doing full depth reclamation to get those streets there. So based on that, we have not built and we have them run um, an optimized model, which is, okay, based on those constraints, just tell me what's the best treatment where, regardless of geography. Uh, and that gave us you know, just shy of 200 lane miles. Well, I ran the numbers on that, and it doesn't come out very proportional. It, it drives it to this location or the other, really. So, it was a bit of an issue relative to that. So we asked him to go back and run it one more time. It said, run this proportionally based on lane miles within each ward. So um, you see here, this is the um, how that kind of breaks out. Um, and then ultimately, this is where we end up pretty, pretty even in terms of percentage of lane miles in the recommended program based on the dollars we're spending. Now, recognize there's still going to be lots of streets that need treatment that are can't get touched because of the yeah. Yeah. But again, you see the um, this is the total percent percentage of the total um, lane miles uh, for years, and then total of lane miles. But this is the big one that proportions out. That doesn't mean it's equal to any particular treatment. It's the optimized treatment. It might be microsurfacing, might be patching, might be this, but it's the optimized treatment. Everything gets overall lay miles. But, and then this is the 10-year investment plan, $12 million based on this. Uh, and you see it runs between $1.3 and $1.2 million. Um, depending on where we can go, we can tweak that year to year um, if we have more money available or tweak it down if we have less or costs go up and those kind of things. So, um, but that's the work plan uh, for these various categories. This just kind of takes that same degradation curve, shows you we do a little bit better than worse first. The blue line is the ward allocated, and it's not too different than the optimized in terms of the tenure performance of it. But it's still down here, and we need to be up here. Uh, but if we get 64% more lane miles treated as opposed to the worst first. So we touch a lot more street. And then this graph just kind of breaks it down, you'll see. You know, it be proportional based on treatments, it roughly works out. So, but this, this is just, if you have a lot 
kind of higher lane mile one two. It's got a bunch of lane miles inside their jurisdiction, so they got more uh, proportionately relative to the proportion of the total lane miles. It works out in the various treatments of like this. So, but where we stand right now, that's where we're How long does it take you to get comfortable with the total optimized program? Uh, I mean, you're saying you have no experience with it, I totally get it. Yeah, so if we go a couple of years with that, with the um, Microsoft thing, and everybody's happy with it, and it looks good, and we're getting good performance out of it, um, then we're there. The issue is, if we're doing Microsoft and we want making an investment, that other stuff is slipping, because at some point we do, do need to do the middle and fill and the other way. So, you know, every five to seven years we should be redoing this, and that took us 10 years. It took us 12 years to do it five-year plan last time, mm -hmm. uh, and 10 years to get back to doing this thing in the mission survey. If we get the right level of investment to keep this model updated, we should be coming back in five to seven years to retouch this and retweak it. Um, the one thing that we, in the old lane model, I had to keep up the database. I'll be fishing everything we have to the consultants that'll hit put it in their model. So every year, I'll be kind of staying up to date. Um, we were real happy with the model that used the last time. It wasn't the performance model, it was the maintenance of the model. This one, I can I can give it to them. They can put it in in a couple of hours and keep it up to date. I'll still keep my inventory of access database, spreadsheet and stuff. But, um, but that will be the first test. That that two hundred thousand a year for a couple of years. I'll see what the response is relative to that. Because you're going to get a nice black streak when you get done. And really, a lot of times, that's what people want to see, right? Um, but there's a that's, that's not any good mm -hmm. if the underlying surface isn't any right. good. So that's so. That's kind of where we need to do that. But if we could do that and keep pushing that out and keep it in a good condition, keep the moisture out of the base, keeps the road going, we may get two or three of those microsurface treatments and get another 40 years out of that road. We just don't know. Um, we want to have hands on the that's right. Uh, but we also, the big part of it is we need to make sure it's kind of proportional, right? So, you know, it, it was pretty proportional <coughs> in three or four wards, and then one with the optimized model was way over here, 20 30 percent more than anybody else. I just can't explain it, right? So, you know, from an engineering analytical standpoint, you say that, but from an everyday citizen, we need to kind of make sure that it's, you know, everybody's touched. But we, so, uh, so that's the reason we're not going with that. And the performance is not that much different given where we are. The spread would get better if we could get more investment, but, but that's uh, that's kind of what we got right now. Uh, the next step, if you guys are okay with the microsurfacing, is we will uh, retain a consultant to um, start putting together the specs and the work plan for the microsurfacing contract. That will be a different contract than Barnhill. That's a specialty deal. Um, so Larry Pavers out of Virginia is the only one that's working this area uh, with that. And then um, we will start preparing um, the next year's resurfacing contract based on this guidance. We, we've got the street list, but it needs to be refined. It's really high level. We just got to tweak. We got to get that the street. That'll take us a couple, three months before we're kind of finalized and ready to put that to bid. And then when it goes to bid, you'll have the actual list for that year. But and then each year, we take the same work plan, go through what's on the list, we put it on the budget. We'll, if we got room, we'll bring stuff forward. If we don't, we'll push stuff back. Do you know of anybody that's doing the microsurfing that we could take a look at? Yeah, so they did it in Nashville a couple years ago. So we've seen that there. Uh, and the contractor is Slurry Pavers out of Virginia who actually did our full debt reclamation. So uh, the rest of the builders out of Winston Center last couple of years, full debt reclamations under Barnhill's contract. But, uh, so yeah, we've seen it. We just we just yes. want to have our hands-on experience locally with it. Come on, in. we'll get a fair number of lane miles. It'll, we'll 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 microsurface more lane miles than you would pay. Get that to work out. The model wants me to go do all in. Well, just, I'm, not, I'm not quite there yet. Any questions? Okay, so one of the takeaways uh, that I think we have as a staff is, uh, as a mayor pro tem, to perhaps look at um, advancing or uh, maybe 
better funding, uh, street pavement program, possibility of including this uh, in a bond referendum in the future. So we will, we will take a look at that and uh, come back to you with what the options are, what does that truly look like, what does that uh, potentially um, buy for us. Uh, obviously it will advance us out of the current situation that we're in right now because that just, that's starting to feel like quicksand. Really, if you don't, if you don't invest more, then we're just going to get further and further. But, uh, perhaps during the budget discussions, we'll be in a much better position to uh, uh, have a discussion with the council about what that might be. Any other thing? That, that was a major thing that I got. Um, and, and of course, the uh, MWCE participation. Sorry, yeah, but I okay. had forgotten that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll have that conversation before we're ready to pull you in. In areas where it's not an issue of the quality of asphalt on top, but some soil condition, I guess, below, um, what is the plan for dealing with those? For instance, on, on Winstead Avenue, just at the intersection with Sunset, there are two holes. I have pictures of in my phone. Um, <coughs> right in the middle of the street. Not a worn out spot, but as though the subsoil is given way. Uh, that's a really broad level question. There could be a million other things. It could be just rutting, so it's just kind of gotten compacted. If it's alligator cracking, those stresses, the stresses we talked about all relate to what the subsurface conditions are. So it, it could be very different, even if you describe it like that. I can tell you what the answer is. If it's widespread, we could do a localized fix. If it's, localized, uh, if it's not widespread, we do a localized fix. If it's widespread, then it's whether it's a resurfacing or a full depth reclamation. So it, it, the answer is it depends. Ideally, the subgrade's good. You just do a little bit of patching and you do microsurfacing, where it's just kind of gravel. You see all the gravel and it's kind of rough, but when it's not broken up and not full of cuts and all that other kind of stuff. If we can do microsurfacing on a street like that, if the subgrade's good, we can push that resurfacing off a lot. But when it starts falling apart, then it gets expensive. It gets more expensive the longer you wait. So. Uh, I'm just going up the Sutton Road, going under the road over town. Uh, that entrance, both sides, who is responsible? Yeah. Yeah. I'm out on that. We talked to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get a lot of talk about that. Really. We can pass that on. We pass that concern. Given the current budget situation, I'm not quite sure what will happen. Any more questions about um, pavement condition? If not, I'm going to ask Councilmember Blackwell. And Miller, you've been here quite a few years or so. Talk about the, the dirt street. Before you get in your presentation, I just want to sort of bring us, fast forward us to where we are now. <coughs> Basically, what I know is just from experience is that when I first came on council, um, there was a big initiative by Miss Gay to um, make sure that all of the streets within the city limits were paved. We had a lot of dirt streets, a lot. So we were aggressive, you know, at um, paving dirt streets, ensuring that every um, area of the city was balanced and how they were allocated. Um, and the work within uh, the sidewalk became uh, really much more prominent for us as things changed and uh, people's habits and behaviors changed, and especially when the economy shifted a different way and um, more people were walking out of necessity. So we did for this Chrisette Council and another to um, invest in more in sidewalks. So we delayed or put to the back dirt street pavement for a number of years. It's been a good period of time. Yeah. And so now I guess it's time to turn our attention back. You know, that yeah. doesn't mean we're caught up on sidewalks. No, no. No. No, we still have priorities, especially within um, what we had done one time was prioritize uh, corridors near schools and uh, major thoroughfares. But I know that you know, at least in the inner city communities, there's a great, there are many streets like Tarboro Street, for example, you know, 
point where you have sidewalk for a period and then disappears and picks up again and then disappears. And if we're looking at um, becoming a city uh, that's really mobility friendly in many different modes, especially walking more health healthier functions, you know, we need to make sure that all of our communities within the city limits are walkable, bikeable. And we have had some concerns from some of the neighborhoods uh, who have been meeting in reference to some of the dirt streets. It's been uh, it's older than dirt, really, that really needs to be paid. And so um, that's why we want you to talk about that. And we know that our need far outweighs uh, our, way, our resources. And so uh, even though staff is going to look at that as well, all right. Just real quick before I start on sidewalks. Yeah, one of the things that's happened on sidewalks since then is, you know, we've been able to get a lot of sidewalks down for the DOT match. We get that down to up 60 cents on the dollar, so we have 40% or an 80% match. Safe class is cool. So we managed to do, I think, 12 miles of sidewalk or something like that. Generally on the thoroughfares and those kind of things, safe routes to schools. So we've gotten a lot of sidewalk done outside of the county. And then we do some maintenance with sidewalks with the resurfacing contract in year to year. Uh, and then we, the other thing is you guys have to approve the sidewalk uh, requirements so when new construction comes in that to add sidewalk on materials. We may want to revisit that because it's not required in residential. So things like that. Um, but so we have advanced the sidewalk. So that that's not quite, I'm not saying it's not a priority, but we got ways of moving that forward. One question. We have advanced the sidewalk, and um, we received a lot of uh, uh, people saying that it's great that we see sidewalks in our neighborhood. But then we get beat up because the grass grows on top of the sidewalk. <laughs> and the city not keeping the sidewalk clean and cut. So, uh, especially in some of the older um, neighborhoods down South Church Street, uh, where you a lot of vacant lot, you see a lot of the grass that's overgrown and you really can't tell it's a sidewalk. That's a that's a maintenance change we probably should talk to you and uh, we'll go back and take a look at it because if it's in front of the belt lot they're supposed to be doing it by ordinance. If it's in front of the bacon lot you have a problem with it. So So it is our responsibility? Uh, well it's the lot owner's responsibility but we're sending out we had lot notices on those vacant lots so you know we end up mowing the lots and so it's a, it's that becomes a challenge. Okay. In front of vacant lots. Okay. Is it really supposed to be a problem? Yeah, I just want to say, I, I know you can't even get to this, but I, I think we need to just take a look again at um, how we prioritize public works responsibilities in communities that have had disinvestment for a long time. And if we want to have a city that is um, inviting and since other people who live in those communities, it's very disappointing. You know, if you're cutting your grass and cleaning your sidewalk to live beside a vacant property, and because there's nobody living there, you know, it goes untended. And then other folks are saying, well, you need to keep your neighborhood up. Well, I keep my neighborhood up, but am I responsible for cutting everybody's vacant sidewalk? You know, it's just like our issue about picking up trash at, um, at houses that are vacant, you know, why don't we just say we're going to have a clean city and we're going to have a neat city and we're going to make that a responsibility. People out there mowing and weed eating, they're doing one section, why can't they do the next section? That's a return. To your point, Councilman Blackwell, I, I do believe though that the city, because I, where my office is, the city has some properties that, that we own. And I think we need to set an example for the city, um, citywide, because I think there's room for improvement. And I'm more than happy to pass along pictures and things of that nature, because um, I don't know who the contractor is, but they're not weed eating and they're not picking up stuff on the side of the, of the road. So to your point, we've got to set the example. Okay. So, so I, I mean, I don't disagree with that at all. I would just remind you that with that comes cost. I think with the resources that we have available, of course, uh, you know, the city staff and, uh, do what they can. And uh, we can up it, you know, we can up the level of services that we're 
we were requesting and want to see in our communities. Some of that too, which quite simply is, um, you know, trying to recover some of the costs that the city has uh, spent in, in maintaining these places. You know what we now? do now is we just lean the property, but I don't think it's been uh, a very uh, aggressive approach to going back and trying to reclaim the cost of that. Amy is here and she's shaking her head. We have these discussions all the time. Maybe you can shed some light, Amy, on what we, what we have out there that we lean well, it's a twofold before you start uh, address that. One, uh, now we have those high power zero turns. It's not like you, like I'm on Push. my grass pushing it. Uh -huh. And the contractor spends about less than an hour. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, blow the grass everywhere. And so some of this stuff that we're requiring can be factored in what we're already paying. Uh, well, we have to monitor them and get behind them. Oh, to make the sure community monitors. Community <laughs> monitors. Well, the oh, community yeah. might monitor them, but by that time they've already left the yeah, project. We, so we would we would probably need someone on staff to be out there monitoring to make sure. That or they we just put it in what we require them. If it's in gonna, there. If you're going to cut the grass, you know, you need yeah. to. It's yeah. in there, but if you don't have staff, right, that's actually monitoring that job and making sure that the contractor is doing what they're required to do, then, you know, it'll kind of fall through the cracks. So, so can I just say that's another opportunity? Yes. <laughs> well, I'll step up for free. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying that's no. another opportunity, and Madam Manager. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe it's time for us to take a look at our approach, mm -hmm. how we're doing it and who we're doing it with, and maybe there's some different ways that we can approach that in sense communities to take care of their own community and the city support um, with some, some money and some equipment. But, you know, um, I think, you know, people are getting paid well. They don't pick up paper. They roll right over what's already there. They don't care about the edges, the details. You know the weed eating and all that kind of thing, and they still get paid a nice sum of money. Well, and tightening up on code enforcement too. If I yeah. own that property, yeah. and you cut, you've cut enough grass that right. you basically totaled it out. That's right. Well, we yeah. gotta get our money. Yeah. We gotta mm -hmm. sell. We gotta foreclose. We gotta whatever yeah. is reasonable mm -hmm. to be able to do. But that's we just can't keep sinking money uh, into a hole. And then it's another opportunity because uh, we used to have summer youth jobs. Yeah. And I was one of the ones cutting the grass at the cemetery <laughs> during the summertime, and um, I don't see a lot, you know, that there could be some opportunities for our youth um, to, to cut grass and do lawn maintenance um, so they can have some money um, to go back to school. I think they helped a lot of youth during that time. Well, at the time you did, I bet you were actually working for the city, and now we contract out all that stuff. Oh, yeah, three dollars and twenty-five cents. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm not saying you're okay. Yeah. I'm saying that it's before running one. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's true. Oh, and then how it, much did you say? Three twenty-five. Yeah. I don't know. We'll get away with that. <laughs> right. But, That's all right. Uh, I was taking out manholes at three twenty-five. <laughs> but then we need to look at the cost of what we pay the contractors versus to what we can do in-house and maybe some of you, yeah. if we can. You want to give us some idea question. about the things that we have out here? What? Just I, an estimated I actually don't even have a good estimate, but I, I'll get you some information on the number of properties out there, mm -hmm. if we lean, <coughs> the, the dollar amount that's outstanding. I mean, certainly if, if council you know, wants to, we could, we could foreclose on properties that, you know, we have weed liens there's probably other rem remedies we could look at as well, such as small claims. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's things we could do if we want to go and enforce the collection on these. Councilmember Walker. Uh, I'd just like to second uh, what Councilman, Councilman uh, Knight uh, said. And um, as Councilman Blackwood alluded to, uh, as far as that summer youth program, and, and it may not have to be just during the summer, but if we could, uh, we could really take an aggressive approach to getting that done, where our youth are working with these contractors or we're contracting 
with uh, agencies that are already within the ward, and we make it ward-based and ward-sensitive, so the youth that are doing the grass cutting and the yard maintenance, they're from within the wards. It builds a sense of pride, a sense of respect, which will in turn cut down on a lot of our crime, a lot of the other issues that we're facing uh, within our wards. So I, I think we should take an, uh, an aggressive approach, try to get that done, and see what we can do to get it done as soon as possible. So, Amy, can you, when you're looking at that study, can you detail it into communities? Like, if you say, for Ward 3, Berkshire, Fox Street, where we got those properties at, that we have to maintain the grades. Oh, we could do that. Sure. Any other questions? Street. <laughs> 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 we have a question before we get to Dirt Street. <laughs> 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 we have to solve the Dirt Street problem <laughs> in the sidewalk. The <laughs> <laughs> summer youth okay. work. Okay, you ready? You can sort of. <laughs> yeah, all right. Okay, Dirt Street program. So, um, real quick, 5.1 miles, 6 streets, 45 streets, about a lot, so 179. We have a lot of other streets of paper streets. That's we're not talking about them. These are the ones that actually have developed uh, parcels on. Uh, 15 streets were paved uh, 2.3 miles under the current program, which has been enacted since 2003. Uh, property owners were assessed $25 a foot for that. Um, the, uh, per current standard, all the projects will be constructed as currently better streets. Uh, annual uh, appropriation making improvements to the top, uh, to top streets on this list. Stopped in 2003. Uh, schedule of public hearing, uh, uh, paving the budget of the streets, and it's part of the process now. So if you have to do, if you brought one for the current process, you would have to identify the streets, do a public hearing on uh, and then run through the uh, notify property owners of the potential assessment. Council orders design and construct the street. Assessment made upon completion of the work. The water sewer line to start a part of the work. Main streets assessed upon voluntary connection with not completion of the work. Um, and then Dirt Street paving is not funded under policy requiring a petition from the property area. The council order constructed 100% assessment of uh, the construction costs. So that's the current policy in the election. Um, so we make some recommendations on some changes to this policy to try to make it move a little better. Uh, one is adopt a new priority. The original priority list was really haphazard over here and over there and, and we would have the street paved and then there would be one right next to it that didn't get paid. So we went through and had to group these streets uh, to get the best time for them. Uh, so priority based uh, grouping of streets uh, into a single project. Projects prioritized based on the number of developed lots so, so um, the density of development is driving to the top where the people most things on the street classification. Looked at three different classifications for this, not traditional, but collector streets, so they're collecting from the neighborhood and moving through out a few of those we have to still go. Uh, and then connected streets, they connected this street to that street, and then we do the next. And then a dead end street would be the last of the priority. And then look at the length of the streets so and how many length of streets. So number of buildings, it may be a long street with two lots of it. Right? So kind of took those three things, activate, act, uh, put them into logical groups and aggregated all of this to give us a kind of a recommended priority. Uh, second thing we want to do is add dip section streets as approved design for streets in the program. This is only streets in the program, not new development. So stuff it's a it's a dip section street that's already that way as a dirt street. Um, and you know it's it's a little bit more hassle to maintain a dip section street because it does have some environmental benefits and those kind of things. Streets awareness program, we recommend it. We stick with what we got. It would be a lot cheaper to do it. It's working out other than not being paid. Estimated cost of that is quite a bit less $100 a foot versus $270 a foot. Um, some may be higher, some may be less, but roughly $100 a foot. Uh, that Director of Public Works would make a determination that the big section is appropriate for the design. The list we have on here, I think there's only one street that I'm worried about that would probably have to be part of the street. Uh, the rest of them look pretty appropriate. Uh, the inspected streets are currently allowed for private streets and projects that are industrial parks. We do have a state, and this is it. So we essentially would take the standards <coughs> and apply it um, on these on these parts. Um, 
consider eliminating assessment for funded projects, streamline the process, and prove by and So if you do it now, you put the one on the list, you got to go by the property owners, you got to pay $25 a foot based on their frontage. So A pays $250, B pays $5,000 in that big part. So it creates some tension where sometimes these projects die in fine because of that. So you may want to think about getting rid of the assessment process altogether so we can move these projects forward and show over. Doing that, though, is a cost of $677,000 based on the footage that we have now. Average assessment per lot with very basic frontage. Um, estimated cost of $3 million for this section. Could go gutter would be $7.5 million. Uh, there's a section in there that talks about the assessment for water and sewer and extended water and sewer. We think we should just separate that from Curtis Street altogether. Not that we don't look at it, but it's not really a governing part of what we're going to do. It's not defined by the process when we do with water and sewer. So the lease section water and sewer assessments and determine what water and sewer uh, assessments on the project of uh, a project basis independent of the project. Not all the, the projects require utility extensions. The first three on the list are there partially because of the number of lots, but none of them require utility extensions. The water and sewer is already there, so they're easy to do. Uh, limits of utility extensions may go well beyond the limits of the project. We're going to look at one at the end where this is particularly the case. Uh, total cost of utility extension may be well exceed the uh, cost of paving, current standard, uh, and then this is just the current fees for utility connections if you come in and connect. All right, so this is a project that is a prime example of why we need to separate the water sewer utility extensions from the dirt street project. Um, in order to serve this project, we've got water to everybody. We've got two projects right here, so we, if we do Louie, we should do this one at the same time. So we group it together. Um, got water down here. There's no sewer, but you also see there's very few people who are even connected to water. So we've got a big investment in water out there. We've got very few customers. But this right here, let's see. How can you see that? Okay, sewer line is back here. There we go, right there. Uh, in order to serve this, we got to build a pump station. We can't do it by gravity. So, um, so that's a whole bigger project in, its, in and of itself in this project. So we can go pave this street, everybody's got water, but nobody's, there are a few that need sewer. We don't know about any particular failures out there. But that investment, $1.7 million for the sewer. Mm. Right? And so do we want to try to pick our one point, do we have to delay paving the street to try to put $1.7 million sewer investment where we don't know if we have demand or not. So what we're recommending is look at it in conjunction, but not Exactly. So we may make a decision. Yeah, we're going to extend utilities in this section as part of the project because it's low hanging fruit, easy to do. Or we just want to go forward and pay them. And if there becomes demand and you're ready to bite the apple and say, we're going to put a pump station in here and we're going to require that it extend the lines and require everybody can, you know, so separate those decisions so we can move the dirt street part forward. Um, and that kind of gets us to, you know, like three options. Do nothing, continue current activities. And that's an option. That's what y'all want to do. Redirect resurfacing funds to virtual paving. We just talked about where we are relative to that. Uh, and, or identify fund, new funding for paving dirt streets. Those are kind of the three basic options we've got. And then, then once we decide to fund it, start picking them off. And if you want, we can go through some of the group of the projects on the end of this. I put them through. I think one of the uh, how you base your priorities is the connector, collector, right. and, and, then, what's and then utility, the existing utilities is kind of back, ends up being back a little bit. Well, one should be to base upon the uh, need and the history of improving the quality of life of the neighborhood or the citizens in the neighborhood. Because you have some of the older neighborhoods, are 70 to 100 years old. That's, that's been around for a very long time. <clears throat> and you may still have some of the citizens living on Dirt Street. So when you try to explain, okay, well, my dirt, I, I've been living on this street for 50 years and it have, it's never been paid. 
opposed to say, well, we have moved this up to a priority to a community that's been there 15 years, 20 years. And it's hard to stand in front of a group of people and say, well, you're not a connector street or a collector street. They say, well, I've been paying taxes 75 years. <laughs> Collecting my taxes. Collecting my taxes. <laughs> Just like I live. <laughs> so, and then it, it also helped to improve those uh, neighborhoods that are, you know, have some, some challenges in it as well. Mm -hmm. So, well, we'll talk about that. Let's yeah. go. Let's, we just got giving to... you some priorities on how to do it. Right. One thing that I would suggest is that we keep them grouped. Right. So, yeah. we don't break them up and do little pieces here or there. Right. We're, we're going to hit that area. We're going to get everything done there and hit that because there's economies of scale. There's, there gets to be some issues with utilities. Uh, the first three on the list we gave you right now, pretty heavily developed, but we don't have to do utilities. We can hit them and be done. Right. The other ones, a little bit longer term, because utilities have to be extended and those kind of things. So part of that too is a little more complicated. So how much? Camel lane and stuff is complicated. Is how, how much for the ones that you've given us here? What's the value of those and the amount of time it takes? So that's my question. I'm looking at three million if we just do ditch. But if we do permanent gutter, that'd be seven point five. But then if we add the um, that's what I want a clarification on. So we just need a three minute, not just three minutes. Right. Yeah, your list has got some cost in there on the side. But I think the annual two hundred thousand annual would take twelve years to eliminate all dirt streets and rocky mountains. Yeah, if you get all the way to the end, there's some that are a block long. You get down to the bottom serving one house, it's effectively a driveway. But, but, you, but you've given us you've given us Swift Road, Alabama <coughs> and Jasper Street, Coral Drive, Emberland and Topaz Avenue. And then a whole bunch in South Rocky Mountain, Amos, Fleming, Heron, Hudson, Jackson, Line, and Melvin Street and Z Street, Todd's yeah, Ferry. These are all like one block um, off of Church Street kind of thing. So, so what's the value pick. of all of this? The ones that you So if you see, so you'll see in Blue Freer Drive, that project's two hundred twenty-eight thousand dollars. Swift Roads, sixty thousand dollars, fifty-eight. Uh, Jasper Allen is one hundred eighty-nine fifty. Those three projects already have water and sewer. Um, so we just have to pay. Uh, it, so if you look at the bold part at the end, that's the cost for that whole group. Topaz Allen, three hundred six thousand dollars. Are you looking at a spreadsheet? At the spreadsheet. I was looking at the map. Yeah. So if you look at the spreadsheet, you got that part in blue that's in bold. That's what the total for that group. Blue and triple, one hundred nineteen thousand dollars. Fred, is it? The cost that you have in there is that cur curb and gutter, or is that that's, no? Well, you've got the one on the left, the lower. That's curb. That's ribbon paving. The one on the right is curb. Okay. You said at the beginning of your presentation, page forty-four. So three, if we just did, just omitted the curb and gutter, would be three million, which was my original question. Yeah, three, three. It's roughly three million dollars. Yeah, this comes at two point seven at the bottom of the spreadsheet, but just call it three to do everything. But when you get on the, like, you may decide we're not going to do Raven Drive. You know, it's a nice connector, but yeah. it serves a self now in one house, right? right? Um, and it's a huge investment, yeah. right? And somewhere so you may wait till that gets developed and then right. you take care of it then, right? right. So, so the dirt roads, are there grants available for, to bring? Not really, paper. not generally. That stuff's dried up. Maybe you can get some, a few CBDG things, but there's lots of other competition okay. for that, so. Now, if you don't do curbing down and just do the ribbon paving, the ribbon paving deteriorates faster than a street with curbing down. It doesn't. No, not really. It's, it's, break all no, it's just more day-to-day -day maintenance in terms of keeping. You got to mow the ditches. Things occasionally we go in and have to regrade them. The big issue with with ditch section streets, particularly, is that it's people when they come in and develop the lots, you got to get strict control of where they put those culverts people just throw them in and then the thing gets all up and down and doesn't rain right. So if you can control it right from the beginning and make sure everything's on there, then you get the grain better and you get better water quality and you do get water capacity. But day to day, you gotta cut it more, you gotta do those other kind of things. You know, you you, you can't park on a ribbon paving street, people are parking on the shoulder, so you have those kind of issues too. So you know, when you get into denser development, new construction, we probably want to maintain the curb and gutter with the water quality features on the back end. 
But to this situation, since they're already working with ditch section streets, you know, we can we can make a lot more bank for a buck by just preserve taking what we got and making it stepping it up a little bit. We may have redo when we do this, we may redo all the culvert driveway culverts to get them all great. So everything's great. So yeah, you know, those kind of things. So if we do that, we can come back and do it. The uh, sewer water stuff. How much damage would it do to the street if you have to come back and do it? Um, really depends. I mean, you're looking about how how much separation. Okay. So um, we can sometimes on the ditch section streets move everything out of the right of way, so we would just damage what we had to go across. We had to do an open track. Okay. You know, and we might be able to bore those services in, maybe, um, and not go underneath. So really, but. When we look at those projects, we would make an assessment as to whether it makes sense to try to do it now. And then you'll have to make a, you all have to make a decision whether you want to assess it before they connect. Because we got a lot of water and sewer out there. We went out there and said, we'll just wait for them. And it takes a long time for people to finally do it. You know, whether you want to go ahead and assess that stuff and get it to connect and so that we'll get some return on investment. But we can separate that distance from the third street. Look at it and say, yeah, we need the dirt street, not the water and sewer, because we're not going to demand. Or, yeah, we want to go ahead and do it. And we, we'll talk to property owners in the neighborhood before we, there's a project. This is coming where you want, or you issue the water and sewer. This is what, so we would take each project as a group that way, and then come with a recommendation once we firm up the call to the <coughs> we want to move forward with this project. After you say, this is the first project we want to do. So we know the church group is there. The a lot that needs to be paid, so if you pay it and don't put the proper drainage, would come back and damage the pay. Uh, we would make sure that the drainage would be right. Just because okay. it's ditch section street doesn't mean it's not going to have good drainage. Okay. A lot of them are draining just fine now. Okay. And that's the issue. So when you start making curb and gutter, you got to do all kinds of changes okay. to the drainage. Besides putting the pipe in, you got a lot of times it's doing that crap in the water behind the lots. Have you ever been in? DOT road when they come in and take a river and take the highway and make a curb gutter and then there's water standing on the lots behind it. You gotta pick up all that drain. So the whole lot developments are usually set up to drain based on that. And converting it to this section after the fact becomes really problematic. So in this situation, it'd be less expensive, drainage would work better. We'll have a little bit we're not gonna have any more operating costs than we do now because it's already dish section street. Right? And maybe it'll be a little better because we'll go get all the driveway culverts on grade so they're not backing the water up instead of being up and down like they are now. Mm -hmm. The one is uh, behind the board of your club and behind the, um, the day, uh, senior daycare is where they did the paving and that water's trapped right in that, right? As the curb gutter street? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a prime example of why we, in these situations we think that maintaining the rhythm payment design would be the best. But we can see if there's anything we can do with that. Yes, sir. So um, I guess we'd like to know if council is ready to give us direction in terms of you know, utilizing part of our street <coughs> funds to get this started or if you want us to um, find additional funds for a, for a budget just what, what would you like for us to do? I, I get the sense that do nothing is not a yeah, viable. Receive it as information and sort of let us know all of it. Okay. And then we would give you direction. I think it's a lot there. Clarification, you're talking about taking from the existing power bill that we allocate towards? Yeah, that was one of the options for us to take which is, $200,000. Which, which, which is only $1.6 million. Mm -hmm. so. So in other words, if we don't do that, we'd have to go and find other other resources to support the, uh, the street uh, dirt paving program. Well, could we do both things? <coughs> Can we do what? Both things. <laughs> we do whatever you like us to do. What but, we do, but, if, um, if the council, like, we would just receive this as information. Okay. Go back and home, <coughs> read over it, at the budget think time about it, yeah. and we'll be about to do so. Give the staff direction uh, during our budget session. Okay. For retreat. For retreat. Okay. 
because we sort of have, don't we have a multi-stage level consideration? We're talking about using money now, figuring out how to do something later, but then we're also looking towards, you know, perhaps bond activities and projects that we would want to see included that we know we can't pay for today, but we need. For the future, for the very near future. And if they read this article, about three streets, you may want to <laughs> change your mind. But anyway, let us um, we'll come Still back and give you direction. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Next on the uh, agenda, we do have uh, our representatives from um, DFI. So if you don't mind, because they're from out of town, yes. that we jump uh, to them and then we uh, see. While they are uh, setting up, ACM uh, prepared for the council at the request of Council Member Blackwell uh, a timeline that will give you the history of the DFI project and the uh, actions perhaps that the council has taken. Um, over the past two years or so that we have been uh, working on this project and she's passing that out now for you as a reference. Manager with the Development Finance Initiative. I'm here today with my colleague Lori Dowdy, um, who is a development advisor for DFI. Can everyone hear me? Yes. So okay, great. <laughs> All right. Um, so the plan today um, is going to be to do a quick overview of the P3's public-private partnerships for housing program. Um, just to catch up, I know we've got some new council members and a new mayor. Um, so make sure everybody knows who we are and what this program is. Um, we then, then we'll get into kind of fast forward a bit in the process um, to the solicitation process overview and really why we're here today, which is to show you the developers that have responded to the solicitation um, and give you all an opportunity to reflect on them um, and ultimately end with a uh, passing it back to the manager to maybe make a recommendation on a potential development partner. Um, so before I dig into that, um, who are we? Um, so DFI is a program of the UNC Chapel Hill School of Government. Um, so if you work in government, um, if you're an elected official, at some point or another, there's a good chance that you are going to interact with the school. Um, and that's because we are a resource for local government. We provide research, but also one-on-one -on -one advice. You can pick up the phone, uh, give the school government a call if you have questions from animal services um, through to real estate development, economic development, all of those issues that impact <coughs> local governments. Um, key is that we do have values that are non-partisan, um, and our goal is always to be policy neutral and responsive to our local government partners. DFI was born out of the School of Government um, when elected officials like you all and staff were giving the School of Government a call on a regular basis and saying, hey, we have this property um, and we'd like to see it developed but we don't even know where to start. How do we attract investment to this property? And the attorneys on staff could say, well, here's what you can do legally, but they couldn't provide advice on what you should do. The same situations would arise when developers would come to communities and say, hey, you know this great mill you have? We'll redevelop that for you. Just you know, give us $3 million in cash. And the school, again, could say, well, this is what you can and can't do legally, 
but they didn't have the expertise on staff to advise on what they should do. And so from that, our executive director created the Development Finance Initiative. And what we do is we answer those questions. How can we help you attract private investment into your communities um, and help you do it in a way that is going to meet the public interests? So because of that expertise that we have and really our work across the state, uh, we've worked with communities big and small. My smallest community was 110 people um, up to larger cities across the state. And because of this work, uh, we were a natural partner for the state when they were looking for someone to help them create a program. Excuse me. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, speak, speak, yeah. There's oh, oh, yeah. something going on. Yeah. Oh, you know what? There's a protest. There's a protest about, oh. the, about the war. Okay. Oh, uh, proposed uh, potential okay. war. <laughs> so what's the uh, not a war. I'm not speaking that into existence. No, 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 no. Okay. All right. Heard you go it. ahead. <laughs> we thought it was a uh, somebody. <laughs> yeah. There might be a video too. Yeah. It's like plow on. Keep talking. <laughs> yeah, keep talking. Go ahead. <laughs> um. So the Development Finance Initiative came to us, and we worked with the state to figure out how we can work with local governments to leverage these disaster recovery dollars to build affordable housing in communities most impacted by Hurricane Matthew. Uh, the goal is ultimately resiliency. So building housing for low-income households outside the flood zones. The program that we developed starts with figuring out and working with a local government partner. So we don't come in on behalf of the state, pick a site, and develop it. We find partners on a local level and we come to them and we say, do you have sites that you would like to see developed for affordable housing? We then go through our pre-development process, which I'll walk you through that. And again, the goal being to leverage these disaster recovery dollars. Um, and what ultimately has come in this process is that the fund is actually going to come out of community development block grants for disaster recovery. When we started this process, it wasn't clear where that funding would come from. But now we know it's CDBG DR. And then our process, I'll walk you through what that looks like, but we end with really finding a development partner to actually execute on this project. So we're not just gonna bring a project to you and walk away. We go out, we find a partner, and ultimately we will stay with you until there is really a shovel in the ground. So this is the DFI pre-development process. We follow the process that a typical developer would take. So any developer comes into a community, they first ask the question of what is the market? So we've come to you before, we showed you the market for affordable housing in Rocky Mount. You've seen the results of that. Um, we then work with an architect and we figure out what we could fit on the site within the regulatory and the physical constraints of that site. And what are any other limitations that that site might have? And how do we address them? We then do a financial analysis and we figure out how do we, in this case, for this program, P3s for Housing, how do we leverage the CDBGDR dollars and attract as much private investment as what we bring into the mix is the, are the public interests. So in any one of our projects, we're going to take this private sector approach to figuring out what a feasible project is, but we're going to bring in that element of what are the actual public interests here? What would the city of Rocky Mount like to achieve with this project? So in this case, we've gone through that process already. You've seen the results of this over the last year and a half, as the timeline shows. Um, and key here, really kind of step one, I'm almost going back in time here, was the selection of a site. And so on February 25th, 2019, the city of Rocky Mount voted to convey the Tarboro Street property via sale or lease. So that's <coughs> still get worked out for the development of affordable housing 
perhaps for low-income households contingent on the selection of a developer. And that selection will ultimately, and that's why we're here today, be left to you all. So, with all of this work in hand, we went out into a solicitation process. So this is different from a request for qualifications, but looks a lot like it. Uh, our goal here is always to make a process that could be private as public as possible. And so we went out in October 2019. This was posted to the Rocky Mount website and shared with the network, Rocky Mount network. DFI directly shared this with 29 qualified and experienced developers. So the goal was to get this into the hands of people that were qualified to do these tax credit developments, which is ultimately how we are going to get this done, and use these community development launches. If used incorrectly, the CDBG dollars could very quickly disappear and have to be paid back. And so it's very important that we find a partner with a lot of experience actually using these federal funds so that we don't come against these issues, come up against these issues. So three responses were received on November 26th. 2nd, uh, community housing partners, Pendergraph companies, and Woda Cooper companies. All three of these are highly qualified and would be a great partner for Rocky Mount. And I can say this because what we've been doing since we received these responses is DFI does the due diligence on this. We check the references, we do searches to ensure, we speak to people to ensure that there's no uh, shady history, that they followed through on their commitments in their pasts. Uh, we ensure that they're qualified to do tax credit developments, that they have successfully done complex projects um, with all of the issues that maybe this site might face. So the evaluation criteria is pretty straightforward. This was looking for a qualified partner. And from that, we were looking for qualifications and experience, not just with the tax credit in general, but for something which is a 4% tax credit, which requires a bond that will come through the state likely. Um, and so you need you needed somebody with that experience as well as with federal funding experience. They needed to demonstrate an ability to execute a project of a similar scale, so something like a downtown site. They needed references from local government partners, and we wanted somebody who could meet the estimated timeline. So I'm going to dig into those three responses, unless someone has questions about the process so far. So Community Housing Partners is actually a nonprofit out of Virginia. Uh, they have a portfolio of nearly 6,000 multifamily units um, in, over, in about 105 properties. They have experience with the 4% tax credits and CDBG, not disaster recovery specifically, but they do have the CDBG experience. Um, and as I said, they are a nonprofit. Uh, they have an architect that would be working locally in North Carolina. We pulled out a few things from the responses that they identified as special traits, right? And in the case of Community Housing Partners, they chose to identify the fact that they have an active diversity and inclusion council. So on all of their projects, they engage this council um, to make sure that they are doing the best possible to meet local goals, for example. Um, and it extends also to how they execute their res resident services. These are some examples of projects that they've done um, in the kind of this, the range and size of units. So for this site, we're talking between 50 to 60 units that would fit on this site. Um, and so they do have experience they don't really have, um, they do have urban experience as well. Um, so they've done redevelopment of some public housing in the past. I didn't choose to show it here because it won't be new construction like what you'll see here. Excuse me. Yes. So, um, and I know they had to take pictures of what stock they already have. Um, but did you have any that did downtown projects from an architectural perspective in particular? Right. So the challenge with community housing partners is that the ones that they've done downtown 
have been rehabilitation of existing buildings. So that's what you said. You could be used. So I didn't have any new urban or downtown examples from them. So, so in our um, architectural requirements or standards, are we sort of creating some not barriers, but boundaries about what it is that we're looking for? Yes. Yeah, so you've got your local code. Um, and so it'll have to meet that. And because it's a downtown site, uh, you know, the setback can't be too much. Um, so they're going to have to build in an urban style. Uh, the building will likely be three, four stories, right? So it's not going to be um, this sort of garden style because it just right. won't fit. Okay. Right. That's the piece about making sure it looks like it's part of what's already there. Exactly. I'll say they, they have experience working in downtown not sure and we can always check back with them because their architect might demonstrate a lot more of that experience in downtown. Like brick opposed to vinyl, not, not the wrong with vinyl, but those types of I'll say that the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency, which really oversees the tax credit program, they do have standards for design. Um, but they are they're more just threshold standards. So you can always exceed those and do better. But there is a minimum. That's right. <coughs> and would some of that come through the planning board as well? But can I add to that question? So if it's going to go downtown and, and, and most of downtown is brick, do we, do we make a requirement even if it's not part of uh, statute that, that it's brick? Well, there could be. Um, costs are going to be a consideration, but I know that you can very easily can do a brick facade, right. so give the impression of brick, and so that could, my understanding is that it could be a requirement. And, and I'm one of the new ones, so help me with cost, help me with the CBG, the R funds, help me with what the city of Rocky Mountain is going to have to uh, invest in this project, if anything, or if nothing besides the property. Um, nothing know. besides the property, period. Yeah, so the city will not make any financial investment above and beyond the property. And, and Madam Manager, could you explain to me why we chose this site as opposed to the ones mentioned, Plans Oil Mill and Crossing to 64? Well, it went through a, a process with uh, BFI. They did their due diligence on uh, all of these sites and concluded that the Tarboro Street really best fit the model. So uh, that's in short why that site was selected. We met with the council um, several times during that reiteration. Um, and I think also to bring a diversity of housing in the downtown area to support um, certainly the college that's there and the surrounding communities. So this is a, a selection process that engaged uh, not only the council but also the community that surrounded uh, the site. And I know that there are differences of opinion about that. However, if you want to have a diversity of housing available in the downtown area, this certainly is a project that will lend itself to that. Because the city also owned the property, uh, that was also um, quite a factor. So that's, those are the reasons why. So we don't, we don't have diversity of housing now, down there, even with the development that's You coming. don't have workforce housing now. No. Don't we have some, some being built now? Not no. workforce housing. And when I say the workforce, workforce housing, that's the market rate. Right? Yeah, ours is uh, we're developing 22 units in downtown, and okay. it's not going to be uh, workforce housing. It's going to definitely be market rate, which is about $1,100 a month. So the average rock amount can't afford it. So we need affordable housing downtown. Thank you. Workforce, workforce housing is what this is about. And when I say, or we say workforce housing, I think we need to be clear about who that will attract. It's folks who are, what, less than 60% of the uh, AMI. Um, and quite frankly, that will support many of the employees that work for the city will fall into that category. Uh, underscore the fact that this is workforce, meaning these are people who are 
floor and, and um, just need safe, decent, quality housing uh, for themselves and their families. And, and we've gone through that whole process with the council and the community. And uh, we're here to move forward uh, about selecting uh, the, the developer to, to, to build these uh, workforce housing. So uh, I think we are so far along now that we can finish here in the rest of the field. Clarification, has, has council voted? Yes. So we can, have, yes. When, when did we vote? Well, we did the council. Well, it's on your timeline. February 29th. 29th. We voted to convey. So, it's, so basically it's a, it's a done deal. But right now, the two we choose the developer is, is we moving forward. So you can please finish your presentation. I'll say again, this is for, I didn't get your full statement. Who? Yours. So your full statement about what? I said we have gone through that process. Now she can finish her presentation. Right. That's, that's what I want to find. Right. It's almost been a year now since we started on it. Right. right, so we're so far along now that we're well, not we going. we still haven't decided. Yes, we have. The two, we talk, we're talking about workforce. Most of the people who are going to be looking at this type of housing are not workers in anymore. They're 65, 70 years old. That's not what we're talking about. Where do you get that? We're talking about workforce. Where does that data come from? It's, it was in that in that package that we received last year at the retreat. Who's going to live there? Well, since then, we have identified that. So that was in February. No, we didn't say this was senior housing. We no. said that it was, what we asked for was inclusion of who would be included within that uh, income category. Right. What they did was told us the overwhelming need of rocking out. They gave us exhausted data on our lack of housing that spoke to this particular market. They also told us that this was not for the very low income and that this was an opportunity to look at building a vision and a capacity for working folk who are already using a lot of their income right now towards inadequate housing. They might be paying high rents and high utility bills because there's lack of stock available. And, and the conversation that we had was what is appropriate for downtown. And what the debate was in the community is, is this the right place? Shouldn't we be looking at only market rate or at market rate or so? And you remember all of that. And what we were asking, at least the majority of us at that time, were saying, let's look at this as an opportunity to say that downtown is for everyone. And let's look at building housing downtown where people who work at the city and who work at the community college and who might be students at the college too could actually be able to move downtown and live. And if you recall at that time, the reporter that preceded uh, Mr. West said, well, you know, I would qualify for a place at that location because I couldn't find anything in Rocky Mountain that I could move into. So I have to live in Spring Hope. That's what he told us. So I think that, you know, the data you gave us is very clear about who was eligible to participate. So now we just got to decide which, the developer. which developer we want to choose. And, and another thing that uh, has been in the media uh, in Raleigh that uh, people uh, who are working cannot afford to live in downtown Raleigh. There's teachers, police officers, firefighters, uh, some city employees. So that's why we said we wanted uh, a workforce housing uh, so we could be inclusive for, uh, for everyone. I'd like to clarify one thing, which is that um, it's not public housing in the sense that the residents can move in and not pay rent. So the rents are actually around 450, excluding utilities. 450, 500 is what 
they'll ultimately pay for rent. So you have to have some sort of income in order to afford it. It's not um, extremely low income households that will be able to afford it. You can, so, so if we want the, the look to match what we have down here, and it exceeds what is budgeted, what happened then? Um, we will, it's something that we can discuss with the state and see if it's an option. We're also pursuing tax credits, so there is um, a cap, sort of, on how much can be spent in terms of credits. Uh, but it's something that we can continue to discuss if it's a priority. Unfortunately, I can't give you a hard answer right now. <coughs> right. Um, so, community housing partners. Uh, the next one is Pendergraph Companies. Um, so they have a portfolio of over 4,000 units uh, and over 100 projects. They are the developer of the three that's done the most Eastern Carolina projects. So they've done most of their work, a lot of it in Goldsboro, they're in Lumberton, um, Rockingham, North Carolina. So they've really done a lot of work in this area. Um, they do have that experience with 4% and specifically as well with the disaster recovery funds. Um, they were recently selected by the city of Lumberton for this program, um, for the P3s for Housing program for Lumberton. Um, and that has gone very smoothly so far. Uh, the developers are about to submit their final application for tax credits. Um, they manage uh, their own developments, um, and they've been active in North Carolina for since the 90s at this point. Uh, they do a lot more, I'll say, greenfield development. So their style is um, less downtown. Uh, they do more of a garden style, but they have a bit of variety in their style. Uh, but they've done projects, a lot of 4% tax credit projects, um, and many of the size we're talking about, but not in such dense, not in such a dense property. So the last partner is Woda Cooper Companies. Uh, they have roughly 12,000 housing units, which have written this unit, um, in 300 properties across 15 states. So they're actually one of the biggest housing developers in the country. Um, They've got a lot of experience with 4% um, and federal funding. Uh, they've done quite a bit of brownfield development, including using certified brownfield funds. Um, I'll say that Pendergraph and um, Community Housing Partners have also done brownfield, but not through the brownfield program, which is a different thing. Um, they recently, you'd be familiar with Boda Cooper because they actually recently completed Ravenwood Crossing in Rocky Mountain. So they do have that local experience, and they did about 80 units. Um, they're a townhome style, um, but that's just, it shows their diversity. So they can do townhome, and they've also done um, some downtown projects in the past as well. Um, they chose to identify in their response that they do have a lot of green building experience. So with Ravenwood, they followed the Housing Finance Agency requirements. Uh, but they've done lead projects all across the country, um, and Earthcraft, they've done passive, zero net energy <laughs> um, projects across the country as well. So sustainability is something that's a priority for them and that they focus quite a bit on. Uh, they also manage their own properties with a network across the country. So these are some examples. You can see they've done 60 units in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, so a downtown project there. Um, Ravenwood Crossing here in Rocky Mount. Um, and another project they completed in Hickory is about 50 units um, in the Beaumont Square Court. Um, so looking at them kind of in a check way, side by side, it's a bit challenging. Uh, but what we demonstrate here, we hope, is that they're all experienced. They all meet the criteria. There's no developer here that does not meet the criteria. I will say Pendergraph and Woda Cooper do have um, a lot more experience doing the 4% tax credit and the tax exempt bond financing. Uh, this can be a little bit tricky. Um, Community Housing Partners does have that experience, and they could do this. 
but Pendergraft and Woda Cooper have more, and they have more in North Carolina. So that's key. So they are familiar with North Carolina's um, tax credit program. So where does that become critical? Is that in the costing out of the project and how you are able to get the most out of the dollar that's invested? It's in the financing of the project, getting the most out of the dollars. You know, uh, the more experience they have, the more trust the syndicators, the tax credit, people that buy tax credits have in them, the more money they'll give them per tax credit. So there's a lot of, uh, a big explanation around tax credits. But basically, the more experience they have, the better value they can get in theory. Um, and they also just know how to maneuver the system more smoothly, which has a time value, so they can do it faster. So does that mean that there is, do they have to help recruit additional funding? Is that, is that what you Yes, so, so this is a private development. Okay, so. so these are private developers, that will go out, you select a developer, you convey the property when they've closed on financing, but they will get the financing. They have to go out and get a loan on their own. They have to get the tax credits on their own. The community development block grants are gonna go through someone else, right? So they are managing and they are gonna develop this and manage this independently as a private developer. And so they are gonna be in charge of all of that. The city is going to be the role you will play is negotiating how you want to convey the property and what your terms are for that. So if you've got um, local minority and women-owned business enterprise goals, that's something that you can secure through the property. Uh, but that's the role you will pay, play. Ultimately, they will finance their own project. So then the project can be bought and sold once developed, tax credits have been in place. Under what conditions um, can that transaction occur? Or might it occur? Okay, so the project, so North Carolina requires a project remain affordable for a 15-year term, okay. but most will, I guess you can say, re-up for another 15 years. So it will remain affordable, monitored, have tax credit right for that 30-year period. After that, if you sell the property, the developer is free to do with it really what they, they choose. Sure. Um, we have a partner, Durham County, for example, they're doing a ground lease model because they want to make sure that if it doesn't remain affordable, it can revert back to them and they can do something else with it. Um, but others, you know, developers prefer after 30 years being able to do what they want with it. Sure. And that would be uh, a council decision in putting those stipulations in place. Right, right. and the conveyance of the property. Right. So then really all it ties to is the tax credits and the grant money. So if I sold it and violated those terms as the developer, then that's what I'm forfeiting. It's still my project, but I've just given up on those dollars. Yes, and well, and you'll have an agreement which says if they don't do the affordability sure, sure, thing, sure. then they violated their agreement with you. So. But because, you know, the rents are, the reason why you don't see a lot of new $500 development that the market just delivers is because it, with the cost of construction, it, it sure. doesn't work out, right? right. Um, and so these tax credits are actually essential. Without them, it's incredibly challenging. Um, so in terms of other relevant experience here, we're looking for people that have used federal funding sources and know all of the rules of the federal government would be required for that, um, and that have also um, you know, done projects in kind of brownfield sites, whether Big B, so an actual federal brownfield designated, or Little B in that it has um, a history, but it's gone through phase one and phase two um, to move forward. They can all meet the timeline. At this point, the January uh, submission of a tax credit application, we sort of missed that, uh, but that doesn't matter. They can apply in May, and so, they can all meet the timeline as proposed in theory. Um, and they all have great references. They all have local government partners. You know, we ask them standard questions that would you recommend this partner? And they all say, I would work with them again in a second. Um, we want to add with Woda Cooper that they are the one of the three that does have, they do have Rocky Mount experience. Um, and whether that's a benefit or not, it sounds like it was a good experience. 
um, is, is up to you to decide. Yeah, I, I, I think So, the next step, I'm actually going to hand it over to the manager, will be for you all to select a preferred planner. If you're not prepared to do that, we can talk about what options are or how we could do it a different way. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand it over. I feel that you're ready, manager. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And so, um, uh, if you go back to the previous slide, uh, given the experience of Lola Cooper, Certainly, it is important to have a developer that this community is familiar with that really has a product on the ground that people can actually <coughs> speak and see and ride by and see the quality of the construction. Uh, it would be my recommendation that, to you that Water Cooper be the uh, selected one. I did not hear. Water Cooper. Mm -hmm. Manager. Yes, uh, so today, are you not expecting us to uh, give you a developer today? That, that would be my recommendation, but I uh, certainly would uh, defer to the council. I think we need to uh, make sure that we are all aligned with Water Cooper. Uh, I certainly can have something prepared for the regular meeting in two weeks, um, selecting them as the uh, as the developer, if you wish. Is it helpful to speak to the next step? Sure. To just kind okay. of clarify what comes next. Uh, so the next conversation. So if you choose a partner today or in two weeks, uh, what would happen is the manager and the city attorney would sit down with the developer to hash out an option to sell or an option to lease, right? You will not close on this property until they have secured certain benchmarks, right? So they won't own it until you know that they're gonna be able to do this. But they do need an option in order to pursue, pursue these tax credits. Yeah, they have to tie the map show that they can get this property. If, and it's generally done by an option. But they won't own it until they show that they do have those tax credits and can finance it. Um, here we've called it a, an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, and we're calling it more than just an option because this document is where you're going to kind of list these public interests and say, so we're going to give you this property, right? You'll have this option to have control so you can enter the site, do your due diligence, and you will be able to own it uh, based on these conditions. Uh, and so the next step would be for the city to sit down with them and hash out this document and figure out what those terms are. That MOU will then come in front of the council for you all to vote on whether this MOU reflects what you want to see. I will say that one thing that uh, I would be interested in discussing with uh, Boulder is topics for the ground opposed to an outright you know, conveyance or even sale for a dollar, whatever you want to call it. Because I think going forward that will um, secure the project for affordability well into Wilmington. So I don't know if that's a possibility or not, but it's certainly a question uh, that I would put before them whether or not that is an, an option. Well, we would we so recommend 30 is, 30. yes. And they might, so for a ground lease well, developer. Maybe we get property back. Yes. <laughs> Developers prefer maybe a 50 year yeah. lease, um, which still allows for us, so like 50 to 90 years. So. so I just want to explore the flexibility with that. We've talked about the sale and their own site. So today we can receive it as information uh, uh, and then maybe come back at our next council meeting and uh, the council is ready to, to either uh, approve the recommendation or not. Uh, we just want to take this information. Council Member Walker will like to speak after me. Uh, 
uh, in reference to this project. Would it, would it be possible, um, you may not have a firm uh, vote today, but if you would authorize us to at least sit down with Walter, is that a possibility to get even more I, well, information? I, well, I think, I think bro, um, you got something you need to say. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh, my my concerns with uh, Walter Cooper being that they are in the ward, I receive weekly calls um, on the operational side of what they do, <clears throat> and looking that they are their own uh, property management uh, company, that means that they will continue if we are to to select them, they will continue to be uh, in charge of their property management. Um, so me personally, I'm not uh, in favor of Walter Cooper right now just because of the calls I receive on a weekly basis. Um, and I can go into into depth about some incidents that happen. But um, if we could if we could uh, like Councilman Mike said if we could just receive it as information to have this this time to possibly meet with all of the developers and do what's uh, what's best for the citizens because I see that the community housing partner uh, they have uh, They do their own property management, but there's no the general contractors to be determined. Um, so that may be opportunity for a uh, local general contractor or to be able to have our uh, either the MBWB subcontractor uh, within that project, which give opportunity. Um, so I, I just like to to make sure we do our due diligence on this decision. Um, again, Walter Cooper, they seem to dot every I and cross every T on the development side but in dealing with the tenants and the people that um, they make their living off of, uh, that's an issue. So I, I just want to, uh, to, to, to to make sure that we do our due diligence in yeah. Just one quick question, too. You. So you're talking about a lease of uh, development once 50 years. The only, thing I, the only reason I come up with a 50-year lease is if I were trying to finance through HUD. And so if HUD is a traditional form of financing of this type of project, mm -hmm. and I'm looking at a 40-year amortization, what happens to the reserves um, for the property maintenance at the end of the term of the lease? Do they revert back to the city? Do they revert to, uh, generally they're required to be put back into the property, but not necessarily. Uh, my understanding is reserves stay in the project. They okay. have to, and the reserves are actually um, required, so a certain level is required sure. by the housing finance agency. Um, after 30 years, and what happens then, um, it is no longer a monitored project. So that is a good question, and so it's something that we're actually working through with our partners in Durham, which is what happens at those 30 years. Um, and so those terms are something we can talk about, which is if they're not putting in the money after a certain point, uh, the city can have the option to get that property sooner than planned. Thank you. That's number one. Um, and also, uh, I think we're just allowing us to have some more time before we make this decision. Uh, Councilman Daltrey was brought up. It was, it was about to ask what are the, what's the definition of workforce housing. Um, I think that was early. We have a new structured workforce housing advisory uh, commission and committee, so I think that would give us time also to sit with them and to glean from their expertise and knowledge uh, on this. Uh, on this. Yeah, but I'm going to say this too, though. Um, <laughs> the next application date is May, right? And so you need time to get it done so that it's ready for submission because we've already missed January. May is next. And what my concern would be, since this isn't my ward, <laughs> is that um, let's get the operational concerns. I'm comfortable that they have, that Walter has the ability to attract the finance so we know they can do a project. But I'm also intrigued by what happens once it's done because the fact of the matter is that, you know, it's, um, Council of Walker stated. People are living there, you know, they have an expectation. We don't want a less than <coughs> stellar project for everybody involved. It's not just nice enough to have a pretty shiny building and stuff doesn't work. Or you have management that's not responsive to concerns that happen. And so I'd be very interested in um, the response of world to um, speak to the concerns that Councilman Walker's already articulated. Because what we don't want is more of the same if it's not working. 
and well, what we really want them to do is fix whatever is Whatever not the working. problem is. So the, we have a meeting interested. coming up Wednesday. Okay, we'll but, but I, I agree with them. I, I don't think that uh, we should invest more if we're not getting what we want. Well, I, I haven't so. been made aware of any yeah. problems there, but we'll keep it certainly talking. I would say I, I think that someone threw out the idea of interviews. Right. Um, that would be a good option. I think it is. Um, it could be you interview all three, or you can yeah. pick kind of a top two that you want to work with and speak to, and we can arrange interviews with them. So um, and I recommend that if you need if you need more clarity. What's the timeline for the next uh, round of funding? Right, so the timeline, here's the thing, the 4% tax credit program, it opens up again for application, not the 9%, just the 4%, we'll open up in May, and it's open until October. Oh, so, so we have time yes. to... Um, the, the one thing is just securing the CDBG DR allocation, so having certainty around the project so that the state feels comfortable saying, okay, this is exactly the pot of money. So in the preliminary application, when they do that work, is when we identify that final number. So, so what? the sooner we can get to that, the better we feel about it being for sure the there. sooner two weeks or 30 days or? The sooner the better, but you need to be confident in your decision. Right. And so we will defer to confidence in the decision. So over. I was going to recommend, since um, Council Walker recommended the, you know, concerning the workforce housing perspective, maybe we could, if we could, may I make a motion? I move that we bring in the top two recommendations from the staff in the graph. Include workforce housing advisory commission members in our conversation. Okay. And have it as soon as possible. As soon as possible. Did we get? I, I heard. I heard community housing think? partners as well. Though is that so? The top two are Pendergraft. Pendergraft and Walworth are the top. That according to your, I was looking at your matrix that had checks and pluses yeah. that you said. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, it's just kind of when how do you compare qualified people with it? Yeah. <laughs> it uh, we have a motion on the floor that uh, we would uh, you interview you want to do all three? Yes sir. Well, I'm okay with that. Okay. And so you want to amend your motion? Yeah I'll amend it to say all three uh, finalists and to actually for us to interview them along with members of the workforce housing mm -hmm. advisory commission. There'll be a second. Second. Discussion. Before you vote, I would like to ask uh, with regard to a voter, they specifically y'all you provide the information that they are interested in sustainability and green development and that's not mentioned with the other two. Yes. So the state of North Carolina has a requirement. There is a green building standard that all projects must follow. Um, they pointed out themselves that something that they prioritize is the sustainability. And so they have they have expertise on higher levels of green growth. So maybe they go beyond the minimum and that. So maybe they would go beyond the minimum and they would have the expertise to do that. Other discussion? Well, on the load of piece, I actually took the manager's uh, suggestion and wrote through their rating work on Saturday, and it didn't appear to be 100% occupied. So I would like to know what the occupancy is on that because that project's been completed for uh, how long? No, not two years. Just a few months. Okay. You okay. just had the uh, open house in July. Okay. Well, still, you know, if there's a need, if there's a need out there, it seemed like it would be. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll stand this up. We'll, yeah. we'll get a chance. Mm -hmm. WB. Would you repeat the motion that you just we, we would do that. You have anything to say on the project? This is the project. I know we're going to repeat the motion in a minute. Do you have any okay. other concern okay. about the project? You do or don't? You do? I'll decide what I want to do. Okay. Well, I'm trying to give you a chance to make. Thank you. I'm your ready. Payment. Okay, you ready? 
May I? Yes, sir. I have no other questions. Okay. Thank you. That's a motion made by Councilmember Blackwell that we include <coughs> three developers that the council will interview and that we include the Workforce Housing uh, Committee along with us uh, for those three developers. I'm representative summit. That's a pretty big committee. We are representative of the subset. Would you like to choose that by now? They have a chair. They have right. a chair. Vice chair. Yeah. Two vice chairs. Okay, so they have a chair and two vice chairs. So we'll do chair and two vice chairs. Okay. Right. We'll just add them. And, and it was. Uh, so, and we'll talk about when we can. I'm still and trying to carry this motion. <laughs> <laughs> so the motion is that Councilmember Blackwell made that we would interview the three developers along with two, the chair and the vice chair of the Workforce Housing uh, Committee, along with Councilor. Uh, and Councilmember Walker uh, seconded motion. Is that chair okay. and two vice chairs? Yes. yes. Okay. All in favor, let it be known by the vote sign. Aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Nay. Okay, six to one. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next item on the agenda. Is I do want to say uh, about the Water Cooper Group, uh, even though they have some maybe operational issues, that we were very excited uh, uh, that a developer did come in that area that was very challenging. And so we can work through those things, um, and, you know, we would be glad to, to entertain whatever um, the council decides to do. So we, just, we don't want to have no article that we're totally against water Cooper. But we were very excited because that property had set so long and they were a very good candidate when they came and they, they built it. And so we just have some things that we need to work through. But thank you, Councilmember Walker, for bringing those to our attention. All right. City Manager, next item. So the next item is a uh, review by the Budget Review Committee. Uh, Council Member Walker, the next item is a review by the Budget and Evaluation Manager. <coughs> comment on the first quarter of fiscal year 20 uh, on our revenue and expenses. Mr. Hunt? Thank you, Council Member Knight. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I uh, appreciate having this opportunity to speak with uh, Council. Uh, with respect to our quarterly report for the first quarter, this reflects budget on a budgetary performance basis the activities with respect to revenue and expenditures in our annual budgeted fund for fiscal year 2020 through the end of September. And then very soon we'll be presenting to the end of December. So we are catching up here in terms of providing that information. You have the four page report, which kind of provides a graphic understanding of by categories and by departments in the general fund um, of this information. And the highlight, we're going to go some highlights of that information. I also want to talk a little bit about power bill allocation. I won't spend too much time on that because uh, Brad did an excellent job of kind of iterating that as well. I do want to talk a little bit about the timing of tax revenues since we have some new council members here. I do want to talk a little bit about the timing because there is some diff there are some variances in timing and then give you an update on employment. Uh, looking at our first quarter, uh, we are continuing to see ad valorem, sales, uh, ad valorem revenue growth and sales tax growth. Uh, particularly the one that we can look at a little bit is in sales tax and we're able to kind of monitor that month to month. We kind of try to check it on the basis of the final months of the fiscal year. In September, I'll show this a little later, there's really only one month of sales tax that's been collected for that quarter as of the end because of the lag factor in the uh, timing issues. Uh, but we did see, we are continuing to see growth. Uh, the operations of the event center are reflected in here with respect to expenses. Uh, the revenue side is a little more challenging, but we, uh, we can provide that, informa we, we provide that information. Uh, the good news is our expenditure growth is, is in line with budget, so there, those expenditures that grow with respect to salaries, benefits, some other costs of business, those have gone up a little bit. We also have seen some capital expenditure increases because uh, typically in the first quarter of the fiscal year, we try to hold off on doing certain capital activity to make sure that we're in good fiscal position for the year, make sure that we meet our revenue estimates. We did have some projects that we were in the process of doing in the prior fiscal year that we continued into this fiscal year. 
uh, carried forward that money. So you will notice in some of the in some of the funds, capital spending is up, and that's a reflection of that. So it's so that should balance itself out as we move forward. And also, we do anticipate, and this gets back to timing, we do anticipate that most of our ad valorem revenue, this is property tax, this is residential property tax, commercial industrial <coughs> machinery and tools, and business property tax, should come in by the end of the second quarter. Most of it comes in by the end of December. There might be a little lag and some of it comes in January, which is reported in the third quarter, but typically most of it comes at the end by the end of the second quarter. On the electric and gas side, um, in the first quarter, we did see some sales growth, especially in electricity. Uh, we also did see that our energy purchase costs were contained, particularly on the gas side. Generally speaking, natural gas prices uh, remain low on the market, which is good for us. Uh, it helps us, depending on the weather conditions. I won't get into what, what warm weather means sometimes in respect to that. Uh, but we also do see that we do have some ongoing operational acti activities, including some capital activities, and our expenditures do reflect that. Um, with respect to water and sewer, water has actually improved. We've struggled in water sales the last couple of years. That's been an area where we had some struggle. We've done excellent on the sewer side and not done as great on the water side. We're seeing that water sales are actually picking up, and that could be potentially because of additional residents moving in the area, more meters being active, some additional industrial activity. The good news is that it's picking up and that we're meeting and exceeding our budgeted projections and revenue on the water side. Uh, sewer sales declined at the same time. We had some lower key customer use, but the real factor gets to dry weather. And the reason why is that uh, when it comes to our resale customers, like the town of Nashville or the counties, with respect to their use of sewer, they're charged for I&I. &I. So that water comes through us and becomes revenue. And it also is an expense because we have to treat it. So it does edge itself out, but right now, with the drier weather conditions we have, we are seeing that there is that possibility of a projectable, uh, of a projectable shortfall, but our operational expenses will decrease in line with that. So our goal, as we continue to move forward, and I've been talking to the Water Resources Director in regards to this, is to make sure that if our revenues are not going to meet expectations in a given utility, that our operational expenses are reduced in order to offset that reduction so that we stay in line with respect to actual activity. We did, however, one of the things that we did use fund balance and the adopted budget to address this, there is an increase in capital activity. We have an outfall project in sewer. We have some additional improvements in water. Those projects are moving ahead of schedule because they are important to continue operation and maintenance of our, our utility facilities. I want to talk about Palgo for a second, and you'll notice in this chart that that line stays relatively straight, but does start declining from fiscal 15 down to 20. That's actual dollars that's not been adjusted for inflation, and that really reflects the biggest challenge, one of the bigger challenges that we have, and that is that because of reduced gas tax revenue or reduced growth in gas tax revenue, along with the per distribution formula for Powell Bill, which part of it's based on lane miles of city-owned road, part of it's based on population. Remember, it's a share of a pie with all the other municipalities in North Carolina. It really creates a challenge for us. So the reality is, and if I were to forecast Powell Bill revenues going forward, say, five, ten years, I would say, at best, you can hope they stay the same, and they may actually continue to drop down a little tick every once in a while because that's just, re that's just the reality of the situation. So that's why it's important for us to have revenues from additional sources. That's why the money that we generate from the vehicle license fee is so important with respect to the goals that we have in terms of improvements, resurfacing, road condition improvements, those issues that we have with respect to surface transportation. I want to talk a little bit about timing of tax revenues. And the tax revenues that I'm going to talk about equate to about $43 million of the general fund budget. So about $43 million dollars of the general fund budget is tied up in these specific taxes that I'm going to talk about. And there's really four of them that are key. The first one is our vehicle tax. Now, we as the city do not collect the vehicle tax. That is collected by the DMV at the, through tax and PAG. And it is paid to us monthly. From the, it is paid by the state on a monthly basis. So we do receive the money on a monthly basis. There's a small processing fee that they deduct. But we do receive that money. Uh, there's about a one month lag in the receipt of those funds with respect to the timing of the fiscal year. So we start receiving it in August. We do receive 12, pay 12 monthly payments, but the first one that counts to the fiscal year is received in August. The ad valorem tax, again, that's on house, that's, that's the other property tax assessed to housing and commercial industrial property, machinery and tools, business equipment. Um, that is predominantly collected in the second quarter when it is due. Most people pay it within a short period of time. 
Amy and her staff at the business office see a lot of activity right at the end of the year, right at the beginning of the year, with people paying their tax, with people paying their Lorem taxes. Sales tax is a monthly. When it comes to the start of the fiscal year, the first one we receive is September, and that's and that's because technically, if we receive it in September, that means that tax has been paid by the business in in July. So, from a timing perspective, in order to keep it with accounting principles, the business has paid it in July, which means that we receive it from the state in September. That's the reason for that. The first time we, the first tax payments that we book to this current fiscal year are in September. Utility sales tax, which is another, which is administered also by the state, and that is on utilities, that is paid out to us quarterly by the Department of Revenue. So this one is pretty much 25% a quarter. I'll show you the rest of these just in a second. And again, I've talked about that we make these adjustments at the start of the end of the fiscal year in order to address the timing and how they apply to accounting principles. So vehicle revenue tax, vehicle ad valorem pretty much stays the same at about a little over 8%. But in the final month, month of May, there are two payments that are made, two months that are, two payments that are uh, booked in the month of June, and as such, you see here it does jump up a little bit, so it goes from 81% of what's received up to about 100%. When it comes to ad valorem, you'll see here, and you see we get about we're at about 24% of what we expect by the end of October, but really we collect the other three the other three fourths during that second quarter in November, December, and Jane, November. December and also that first part of January. So the end of the second quarter, beginning of the third quarter, is when we collect about three fourths of the total in our in our ad valorem property tax. Uh, sales tax again, not much as you don't have really any collections in July and August. It starts in September and then it goes up gradually on a monthly basis until you get to June, where then because of the two payments that we receive and then book back to June, you end up with three payments in the month of June. So we receive about three-fourths of our sales tax by the end of the month of May, and then in the final month, for recording purposes in June, we receive the other 25%. Now to talk with respect to employment. Uh, overall, we've been doing pretty good, and we have an update with respect to November. We have seen, by, in October, we had seen two consecutive months of employment growth. And compared to last October, we were ahead of our performance. That the same held true for November. We had a third consecutive month of employment growth. That just came out in the last week. Um, saying that's true on the city level, this, this information to the left is for the city. This information is collected by the state, uh, the state department, of, uh, state department of Labor. And then overlooking at the metropolitan area, again, two consecutive months of growth tied into looking compared to uh, October of 2018, they're up about 1,540 jobs. So we have seen some improvement in employment, uh, which of course the key things that we are looking at when it comes to local economic performance, we're looking at employment, we're looking at property values, we're looking at taxable sales. There are those metrics that we can look at, and that we can look at in relative real time. The information from the Census Bureau is delayed a little bit, so. That's great and it's important that we have that information, but we do try our best to use those measures that do exist to be able to measure the performance of our local economy in real time. And again, even at the local level, we're still able only to really look at it from an aggregate perspective. We understand that conditions can be different for different neighborhoods, different parts of the counties, and so on. Looking in terms of how the composition of our local job force, this is for non-farm positions. Uh, there's about 57,000 total non-farm positions in the Rocky Mountain MSA. This is only available for the metropolitan area. It's not available on a city-wide basis. Uh, so it's combined National and Edgecombe counties. About 46,000 of those are private sector. So, so, so more than 80% of our, of our local workforce is private sector. Uh, about 13,000 are in the goods production, but 44,000 are in the service providing industries. So that, of course, has been a major shift for us locally. We, we, we have about we have about 10,000 manufacturing jobs, which is still close to 20, not just below 20% of our total workforce is in manufacturing, which is still high compared to a lot of other parts of the state. Obviously, it was a lot higher 10, 20 years ago. We understand how those differences have, how those differences have taken place. But you can just see here, as we go through there, you can see how the structure is. 10,900 government jobs, that includes teachers. Typically, in the summer, you have a drop down in that and we see that change with respect to the fall. Conclusions, we just, uh, the local economic continues to improve, and obviously we realize that growth is key to improving the fiscal function of the city. 
that's all I have in the presentation. Uh, what will we have to do, I guess, I heard you say about, what will we have to do to try to get that, if you could get it by zip code and get it by war? Is there any way we can do anything like that? There's a possibility of doing some of that information on an annual basis, okay. but not on a monthly or quarterly basis. There's some information we can get annually on that basis, but from the Census Bureau, but we can't get it below that level. So we can get it, um, so we can get it on an annual basis uh, for zip code. Either, either zip codes or what they call census blocks or census, census blocks, census tracks, yeah, census tracks. I'm sorry, census tracks. Mm -hmm. Do you have an average wage relative to the various job uh, you know, service versus health care versus you know, corresponding payroll, average payroll associated with those jobs? I don't have that on me, but we can provide that information. Conversations that are had by Mr. Yeah. Tulsa and yeah. by Mr. Ferris and others. Yeah. Uh, it's a little bit of a challenge, but obviously we can kind of see as new businesses come online, and there might be some ways that we can track that. Uh, I know Alan Matthews does track has tracked that in the past, so there might be some ways that we can that we can work with that. So, so if we can do that, we can do. Can we anyway gauge our how well we're doing on preparing? our employment for those new opportunities. We can we can give we, it a good try. We can definitely try. Yeah. We can definitely make an effort and try and see what we can play. We'll see what other jurisdictions are doing in that regard and see if we can find a model that will work for us. Yeah, so so yeah, I would be very interested to see some of that where the high unemployment rates are at, how we can get in there what it would take to lift those up. But I was to recommend, I think we talked about it before, but we make a lot of investment, you know, as a city and as citizens through the city of Rocky Mountain and all of the economic development activities. And wouldn't it be great if we could just get like a quarterly update and come in all meetings where we have the chamber come in and uh, the gateway partnership and uh, maybe even workforce development, mm -hmm. um, which manages federal dollars for workforce training, just to give us a sort of, and, and Mr. Matthews, the health of the economy, mm -hmm. how we're faring every quarter so we can see how we're trending yeah. and um, look for opportunities to strengthen. You know, yeah. uh, I think we might be challenged in some of that data, you know, being specialized because of the way it's captured mm -hmm. and reported. But they should certainly have trends about what's working, what's not working, where things are going, mm -hmm. where gaps are. Yeah. They yeah. probably have a staff analysis to go along yeah. with, with that data. So we can we can certainly do that. Um, uh, let's see the first quarter, this calendar. But anyway, okay. we, we can certainly. But, but at least, because I think every, you know, each one, each one of us serves on various boards, like you and I, we serve on the partnership board, and, you know, at the very least, just give presentations that we can circulate if there's not yeah. time to do it, because these meetings, the ones I've attended in the past five or six years, are pretty full. Cool. So I'm not saying no, I'm just saying at least get the information, but don't let time be a factor of not getting the information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I got a concern specifically about the Carolina Gateway since the restructuring. We are a major <coughs> investor, a major investor, and um, I like to hear from them. I think they got time to. Well, I'm saying no. I'm just saying I don't want that to be. I'm saying no. <laughs> what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, if we need yeah. different, what well, I'm agreeing yeah. with you. Yeah. And if, if we can't find the time here for them to come, yeah. at least if nothing else, get the presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I think they'll come. 
I don't think he was questioning whether they would, just how full our meetings are. Right. No, I, I think yeah. we will accommodate for them to be here. Yeah. Absolutely. For myself, it would be helpful as I look at War Three and get some idea of what needs to be happening to increase the home ownership and employment in those areas because one kind of so well, the correlation. Yeah. Okay, that's right. Okay. Next item. Yes, um, the final item uh, on the agenda is a request for another um, closed session for attorney client issues. Yes. Yeah, motion that we go in closed session for attorney client issues. Motion made by Councilman Miller, second by Councilman Blackwell. All in favor? Aye. All in favor? meeting to order. I want to welcome everybody and wish everybody a happy new year. This time uh, I'd like to ask Councilman Blackwell if he would uh, pray for us. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> Let us pray. Happy New Year to everyone. Father, we thank you for giving us the blessing of life and health. And we thank you for a new beginning this year. We ask that you help us to to liberate in openness and equity and fairness. And we ask that you help bring a spirit, Father, of excess in blessing in this community. We certainly need it. We thank you for our leadership and we thank you for all of those who work hard every day to bring quality of life in a positive way to all of our citizens. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Personnel ordinance, you know, obviously we're new to the, to the council and didn't have an opportunity to, to weigh in on that or hear that. And I don't know if it's proper to discuss now or ask them to table that. 
Um, if we could come to item five on the fourth, we could just approve these minutes. And then oh, we'll oh I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I'll I'll see on this. <laughs> 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 All right. So, approval of the minutes of the regular scheduled meeting. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. All right. So moved by uh, Councilman Knight and then seconded by Councilman Joint. Uh, is there any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, by like sign. Okay, item 5, consideration of minutes and recommendations from a regular scheduled committee of the whole meeting held December 9th. Uh, this ordinance for amending personnel ordinance recommended approval. So, I'll acknowledge you, Mr. Dalton. Again, I, I would either like discussion or table that. Is that a motion to table? I would guess I'll make a motion to table that. Is there a second? Second. Second. All those in favor? Uh, is there any discussion? No, no discussion. Okay, uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Nay. All right. I'd like to make a substitute. Blackwell and Knight. Motion made by Daltridge, seconded by Walk. I make a motion that we approve minutes of person that order. No, not the management table. The management table for this meeting. <laughs> All right, absent of the ordinance, amending personnel ordinance, uh, is there consideration of the minutes uh, for the committee of the whole be adopted? Uh, striking the, or tabling the uh, personnel ordinance, James? So moved. Second. Moved by Blackwell. Second by Knight. Um, any discussion? All in favor will say aye. 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 All opposed, like sign. Mr. Come back to the next meeting. Thank you. Okay, well, that's it. Community update. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to uh, begin the update by um, speaking to the fact that on Monday, uh, January the 20th, the Martin Luther King Jr. Commission <coughs> will host the 32nd annual Martin Luther King Jr. Unity Breakfast. This is a co hosted event sponsored by uh, North Carolina Wesleyan College. Uh, the breakfast and program will take place at the college's Dunn Center for the Performing Arts and kicks off at 7 a.m. I believe it is. The event's uh, keynote speaker is Anita Earls, who is an Associate Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court, founded the Southern Coalition for Social Justice, a nonprofit legal advocacy organization in 2007 and served as its executive director for 10 years. While there, she litigated voting rights and other civil rights cases. Following the breakfast, volunteers will team together for the annual Day of Service projects. Anyone interested in participating in the Day of Service should call Area code 252-454-1682. All events are free and open to the public. In conjunction with the City of Rocky Mount's 32nd Annual Martin Luther King Jr. Unity Breakfast Celebration of Martin Luther King Jr. Day, the Maria V. Howard Art Center, located at 270 Gay Street in the Imperial Center for the Arts and Science, Sciences, will display where the dream began, Martin Luther King Jr. in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, which will in part highlight King's visit to Rocky Mount when he delivered part of his infamous I Have a Dream speech. The Art Center is free to visit and operates Tuesday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. and Sundays from 1 to 5 p.m. Beginning Saturday, January 25th, Visitors will be able to explore the science of how things move by land, sea, and air at the Children's Museum and Science Center. New traveling exhibition from here to there. The exhibit is in the Imperial Center for the Arts and Sciences and will run through May the 10th. The Maria B. Howard Art Center Spring 2020 exhibits are now open at the Imperial Center for the Arts and Sciences and includes the Black Light Project, Ann Wilson's markings of wildness and hand, handcrafted jury ex exhibition. We encourage you to ensure all your household, your neighbor's household, 
in your community are counted in the 2020 census. The census will determine funding for housing, programs, schools, hospitals, economic development, and much more in our community. Your confidential data can be submitted online at 2020census.gov. Those who do not respond online will receive a paper application in April via regular mail. Please stand up and be counted. As you may have noticed on your way in, phase one of the City of Rocky Mount Wayfinding Project is well underway. This project is designed to assist both first-time visitors and residents in identifying places of interest. Signs can be found in many areas, including the Atlantic 64 Interchange, various areas throughout downtown and along the downtown perimeter. Currently, 22 vehicular wayfinding signs and 22 parking signs are already installed at a cost of $186,000. Municipal identification signs for Holly Street Park, City Lake, Lancaster Park, and Marigold Park are expected to be installed in March at a cost of $22,200. Currently, the final locations and content development for five pedestrian kiosks are in process with an anticipated late summer completion at a cost of $27,000. And then finally, I have assembled a committee led by uh, our Interim Communications Marketing and Public Relations Director, Dorothy Smith, to study and recommend to me the staffing needs and the capital cost needs associated with televising city council meetings. I expect to have follow-up information to share with the mayor and council uh, beginning in February and March time frame. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we'll be hearing petitions from the public. We're going to move that to the end of the agenda tonight. So uh, we'll move on to presentations and recognition. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Sumner to come forward. Proclamation from the City of Rocky Mount. Whereas human trafficking involves the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, buying, and selling of human beings for their services of labor or commercial sex for the use of force, fraud, or coercion. And whereas human trafficking violates basic human rights and deprives victims of human dignity and freedom, victims are dehumanized and forced into modern day slavery. Human trafficking is a growing global and national problem with North Carolina being consistently ranked among the top 10 states for prevalence, for prevalence of human trafficking. Whereas it's imperative that we educate our communities, our young people, and families to take an active interest in learning how to recognize the risk and resist predators who use coercion and threats to manipulate children as young as 12 into labor or sex trafficking. And whereas, in recognition for the need of that education, the North Carolina General Assembly enacted legislating mandate, mandating that sex trafficking prevention and awareness information be included in sexual health education curriculum and enacted legislation in 2019 mandating that sex trafficking training be provided to all public school personnel. And whereas uh, the Pitt County Coalition Against Human Trafficking seeks to eradicate human trafficking by empowering organizations and individuals through collaboration, leadership, and training, and Rocky Mount is committed to protecting people vulnerable to human trafficking and taking action to end human trafficking through prevention, prosecution, and partnerships. Now, therefore, I, Sandy Robertson, the mayor of the city of Rocky Mount, do hereby proclaim January 2020 as Human Trafficking Awareness and Prevention Month in the city of Rocky Mount and commend its observance to all our citizens. Thank you so much, sir. recognizing the sorority of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority, the Epsilon Gamma Zeta Chapter, 
on the occasion of its 100th anniversary, January 16, 2020. So a representative would come and receive this, that would be fantastic. All of you, come on. I just want to... this after this morning, sometime today, and ask about that. And I understand they're considering changing that address is listed so it will be clear that the property is outside and that's what we're doing. Rather than showing only the address of the property owner. The state, would you like to speak to that? Can you hear me from here? Yeah. We can do that. <laughs> what we plan to do is just try to clarify that's what the situation is and you are correct the property owner and their address is what you see listed here but the property is located uh, somewhere outside of the city but, so we'll make something that clarifies that it is outside the city and where it is does that help? thank you does anybody else have any questions from the state once she's here? Thank you. <coughs> Do I have a motion to consider item 9? So move. Mr. Joyner, move. Is there a second? Second by Councilman Walker. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, say aye. Item 10 is consideration for the resolution declaring the city's official intent to reimburse expenditures made for the replacement of equipment. Elevator replacement, city hall, train station, cooling tower, backhoe, side loader, Vermeer vacuum unit, 50 foot fully hydraulic derrick, articulating telescope aerial device, articulating 
telescopic aerial device with material handling, handling a directional boring system, two screw pumps at Highway 97 lift station, two duplex screw pump controls, electrical control cabinets, clarifiers, dump truck, and street sweeper required in connection with fiscal year 2020 installment financing, $3.79 million. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. So moved by Blackwell. Blackwell. Second by Joyner. Any discussion? Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor, I'm <clears throat> what is listed in there, um, I tried to cross-reference the contacted the manager of the CIP on this and I only found three items in the CIP and then um, I do have concerns with in, in being new to this talking about advancing the funds from the various electric sewer and gas funds with the intent of, of um, repaying the, uh, those funds advancing them from those funds to the general fund is that typical, or do we always do that? And then, where in the CIP are these other things? Because I can only I could only locate um, three and possibly four of the items. Okay, so I, I will ask um, Ken to address the CIP issue. But yes, this is typical, and the reason why we advance the funds is so that we can um, procure uh, the uh, equipment that is to be purchased. So it's borrowing from the funds to go ahead and expedite the acquisition of, uh, of the equipment. And then when the financing comes back, it's re you know, put back into the respective funds. So that is, that's fairly typical. The city does not have um, any concerns about not being approved for the financing given our <coughs> financial standing, so there's no concern about whether or not the financing will go through. So rather than slow down operations, we go ahead and spend the funds, purchase what we need, and then when the financing comes through, we replace it. So, so that's what it, that's what that process is. Let me add to that. So what happens if we if we don't purchase something that's, I mean, how, how is that money handled if we don't purchase something that's on there? Well, if we don't purchase something that's on there, then the funds remain in the fund, there's no need to expend the funds. This just allows us to um, go forward, anticipating that whatever we have spent, when the financing comes through, then it's, it's put back. Okay. Mr. Honor, would you like to ask a question of that? Yes, sir. The, uh, all these items are included in the CIP. Uh, I do want to clarify that. And the other, uh, and I'll go through each item individually, if that's the wish of the chair. Uh, elevator replacement city hall, yes, it is a project. Train station cooling tower, yes, it's a project. The backhoe is for cemetery operations, and that is a uh, that is a CIP project. The side loader is for environmental services, and that is a C that is a CIP project. The Vermeer vacuum truck, I believe, uh, is a sewer project, and it is a CIP project. The 50 foot hydraulic derrick, that is a bucket truck, uh, if I'm correct, and that is a CIP project, and that's in the electric pump. The articulating telescopic aerial device is a Electric uh, bucket is another large dairy truck and it is a electric CIP. The articulating telescopic aerial device with the material handling is in the electric fund as a CIP project. The directional boring system is in the gas fund and is a CIP project. The two screw pumps at Highway 97 Lift Station is in the sewer fund and is a CIP project. The two, two, two duplex screw pump control panels uh, are part of the lift station project and are a CIP project. Uh, the electrical control cabinets with respect to the clarifiers are in the sewer fund and is a CIP project. The dump truck is in the sewer fund and is a CIP project under equipment replacement. And the street sweeper is in the stormwater fund and is a CIP project. I'm not sure if uh, Council Member uh, Dodridge and others um, perhaps you didn't receive the memo that um, I sent out in response to your question this morning, which has the uh, particular account numbers so that um, you could be able to trace um, where these things are in the CIP. Well, while we have Mr. Hunter here, does anybody else have any other questions for him or Mr. Soldier? We'll make sure that you, that you get it. I don't know, we've, we've been having some challenges with uh, emails lately, but yes. Yes, and so that information was probably sent out right before noon, uh, where Ken prepared the 
information that he did. The only difference is he did include in the memo the account number uh, associated with this Thank you, Mr. Honor. Is there any further discussion? I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Lights on. Okay, item 11 on the agenda is consideration of granting blanket signatory authority for all HUD related CD, BG, and home documents, inclusive of grant agreements, vouchers, and applications, to the mayor and city manager as co HUD certifying officers. This authorizes the mayor and or, or city manager to independently sign documents. This is a new requirement, by the way. Well, it's a requirement before it was set up so that the mayor would, would sign those things and then the, in his absence, um, the city manager, I was authorized to do it. This helps to expedite. Uh, we had just a little bit of a staff who went the transition between mayors and uh, it does affect our ability to draw down funds in a very timely way. So in the event, um, now, uh, we could have signature authority being shared between uh, the mayor and myself. Council would be able to see what. Absolutely. Absolutely. As yes. Okay. yes, as is approved. So these things were approved because of that little transition. Okay. And what had been authorized and approved and accepted by HUD was that the mayor was specifically named. Had they allowed us to not name individuals and we could have gone forward with what we had but because uh, it required uh, a signature from Mayor Combs who was no longer mayor uh, we had to take a step back so this is a minute. thank you Mr. Mr. Mayor is this the exception to the rule or is this the rule that is it going to come before the, the council prior to yeah. signing if 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 it's on uh, time allows it, or is it just Automatically will be signed. It, it is not a blanket signature. All uh, actions uh, come before the council for okay. approval. So moved. Second. All right, motion made by Mr. Knight, seconded by Mr. Blackwell. Um, any discussion? Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say aye. Passes. All right, item 12 is consideration of certified statements of North Carolina Department of Transportation certifying the city's local general funds committed to the transit system will remain at the fiscal year 1993 funding level and at the fiscal year 2019 funds $234,676 were expensed by fiscal year in requirement for an application by Tar River Transit for fiscal year 2020 and state maintenance assistance program funding. $341,250. Um, the recommendation is to authorize the mayor to report to execute the fire certification and authorize the manager to execute the intent letter to the North Carolina Department of Transportation. Moved by Miller. Mr. Miller, is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Warner. Is there any need for discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Like sign. <laughs> okay, item 13. Uh, I'd like to recognize the family of uh, the leaders dropper. Here you guys would stand up. Website domain, rockmountnc.gov. The renewal fee is 
is uh, recommend, recommended action is authorized the mayor to execute renewal authorization <coughs> letter on behalf of the city. Is there a motion? So moved. Move on. Ms. Miller, second. Is there a second? Second. Second from Mr. Joyner. Okay. All in favor? Any for discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say aye. Okay. Item 15. Consideration of the following bids. A, three, Altec model trucks. One, Altec 50-foot fully hydraulic derrick. One, Altec articulating telescope aerial device with material handling insulated. And one, Altec articulating telescopic aerial device insulated based on bid awarded by Source Well Group Purchasing Group Program. Formerly National Joint Powers Alliance, contract number 012418-ALT Public Utility Equipment with related accessories. Award to Altec Industries Inc. at a total cost of $652,505. Uh, B. Pulp Inventory and Inspections <coughs> Award to Utility Partners of America at a total cost of $195,375. Includes a base bid of $167,625 and alternates 12 and 13 at $27,750. Also, the Battle Park Master Site Plan award to CPL at a total cost of $50,000. The City Hall Elevators award to H&M Kern at a total cost of $768,000. Includes base bid, City Hall Atrium, and staff eleva elevators at $580,000, and alternate bid for Police Department Elevator at $188,000. Recreation and Playground Equipment for Lancaster and Maricola Park, based on bid awarded by Source Well, formerly National Joint Powers Alliance, contract number 030117SFS, award to SOF Services, Inc., at a total cost of $108,000. Recommended action is to award bids recommended, authorize the purchasing division to issue purchase orders, and execute bid, bid documents for A, B, and E in accordance with the council award. Three, authorize the mayor and city clerk to execute bid contracts for and C and D on behalf of the city. I have Sir. a question. I know we don't have a motion yet. But okay. With regard to item C in that list, the Battle Park Master Plan, Master Site Plan, are we authorizing the work or are we authorizing the choice of the provider for that time? We're authorizing the consultant that is going to work on the development of it. So we still have an option, the opportunity to see that plan and have input and vote on the actual plan. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. So is that a motion? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think your award's on the Okay, all right, so I'll make the motion. I was trying to be respectful. All right, this right. button will be in a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Ms. Miller. Uh, is there any additional discussion? Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor, and I'm sorry to be so long-winded tonight, but um, in, in the past that I've attended as a citizen, the uh, city council meetings, we, we've done a, a bulk purchase with other communities on the polls, and I don't know if we still do that or not. And then secondly, I just want to bring, also as a citizen, I've been out there in the, in the audience and listened to how things don't go to certain parts of the board, and I do get that. But we had a uh, park and rec study done back in 2015, and I represent Ward 5. In Ward 5, we only have one park. And that one park that we have was, we, the only reason we have that is because Bun Farm was annexed in the city of Rocky Mountain. If that had not been annexed, we would not have a park for the citizens of Ward 5. Right now, we only have two acres, which is um, 0.23 acres uh, per thousand population. And according to the study, we're about 12 acres uh, short, and we were six acres, I mean, six parks in deficit compared to the rest of the city. And then when they rank projects in the study, Ward 5 had one, three, and seven of the top 10 projects, and we've yet to have it since 2015. I'm making a statement because, because it's obvious that, I think it's implied that Ward 5 and other wards get a lot of things, but I don't think that's the truth, and I think it's evident here through the facts. 
Um, we've done a few things. I support in support of what's on this agenda, but I just wanted to bring that um, to the city council's uh, attention. Could I speak a moment on that? Because I represent Ward 7, and we also only have one party. But I have been told uh, by our former, now retired assistant city manager, Peter Barney, that at the time the inner city was developed, there were plans, there were funds in place that financed those parks. And so we had funding that allowed the city to build lots of parks. In the more recent years, when Ward 5 and 7, I guess 6, were developed, that, that funding was not so available. So someone with Parks and Recreation can speak to that in more detail. I would like to uh, suggest that we um, take this matter up when we have a chance to, to really review that. I was not here in 2015, so I can't really speak to that. But I do think, um, Councilman uh, Miller, uh, the first year that I was here, there was a, a park in your ward that was uh, reworked, yes. reworked and, and the community seemed to be quite um, Right, and I did not make that statement as a complaint, just to say that that was the explanation that was given to me in years past as to why the discrepancy in the number of parks in various wards. Uh, and perhaps we did something as part of our uh, I, capital I, management plan. Yes, sir. I, I do want to say that we need to take care of what we already have. Most of the parts um, before the master plan in the inner city, uh, those parts uh, needed repair and needed new equipment. And so I don't, I don't want us to lose sight of that. And as the city grew, um, those towards five and seven, uh, typically uh, uh, for parts, uh, I think those children were going to the YMCA, whereas those that living within the inner city could not afford to pay those annual fees or those monthly, monthly fees. And so we need to just look at that um, as we um, discuss about disparities um, with parts in the city of Rockland County. Okay, I think these are all fine comments, but I'd like to uh, mention that we have a motion on the floor. We have a second on the items listed. Is there any conversation related to the items uh, that we have uh, a motion on the floor for? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Could we have someone from either Parks and Rec or South Rocky Mountain Community Center uh, come give, give insight as to what type of equipment uh, will be purchased so that the citizens can have a better idea of what we'll be seeing in the future? Mr. Mayor, that's something we can do. spinners, a zip line, uh, we're going to have a top lot, and a number of other things. It was a fun experience, so we showed them the pot of money that we had fake dollars uh, and let them place uh, what they wanted in a regular priority. And we sat back and just let them play that, and then we got down. They had a, kind of like you all would do when you do the budget, they had to determine what they wanted most. And what they decided, what they voted on, that's what we put into the place. Thank you. Sir. Any questions? Any other comment? All right, I have a motion uh, to approve, and I have a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, say aye. Thank you. Okay, now we'll move to the public uh, petitions. I have a question. Yes, sir. Mr. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Give me your reason. Uh, I'll get you stated why you move item 7 from the comment to item 16. And it's this one being just for this particular meeting was to do out the whole it was just for this particular meeting, and uh, quite frankly, it was related to trying to get through a number of these awards that we wanted to make, and knowing that we have to also go back into private session after this meeting. Okay, so just for this meeting. Just for this meeting. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. 
Mr. May, we, we discussed about the uh, planning board uh, filling that position. Uh, is that, do we do that now? Or? Uh, yes, sir, that would be appropriate if you have a nomination for the planning board. It should be in the packet that, that you received earlier. Um, Sure. Her name is Jamie Matt Pittman. She's a longtime resident of Rocky Mount. I think when she came back, she was actually in a dead sale bill. <clears throat> the form that she was actually in real estate, but she um, and she'd be a great addition to the planning board. And actually, I wrote off when I was elected to the council, so we're replacing me. I make the motion that she be appointed. Okay. Mr. Joyner has made a motion that Jenny McDittman be uh, nominated for the committee. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Mr. Blackwell. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? So moved. With regard to the Workforce Housing Committee, I think the Ward 7 may be the only ward designated vacancy remaining. And I do finally have someone willing to take that decision. <coughs> and I'm expecting to get her uh, personal history form very shortly. Very well. We'll look forward to that. Okay, with that said, I'd like to uh, ask Mr. Tom Harris to uh, please come up. As always, uh, comments are supposed to be uh, related to things that are related to city government that we control. Uh, it's not any personal directed to any one individual. Thank you, sir. Uh, Tom Harris. I live in uh, Joshua Clay in Ward 6. Last month, I talked briefly about the operations of the Event Center. It was certainly good to see some recent uh, information in the Telegram. And uh, I do have some follow-up general information that I would just like to, to make public. First of all, I want to thank Amy Stanton and her people. Um, this is small Tony. I dropped in unannounced in mid-December. Asked to see a hard copy of the audit report. Yes, it's online, but it's good to have a hard copy. And she and her staff uh, uh, provided me space and time, and Amy answered some questions. So I want you to know I really appreciate her hospitality. On page 15 of the audit, it mentions that the Rocky Mount Public Finance Corporation, and that's the entity that, you know, regarding the event center, that those financial results are blended presentation within the full audit report. The word blended, you can go any way. But for transparency and for us to continue to know uh, how successful we want this event center to be, I think the financial results of the Rocky Mountain Public Finance Corporation, the event center, be segregated and not blended in future audit reports. One thing, the, uh, the article last week in the paper, I did not see it, but yes, we did have a operating deficit, but we have a $2.7 million debt service payment this year. 1.45 million for principal and 1.22 million for interest. And that is just the beginning of a long principal and interest <coughs> debt amortization. So I just want the people to know that yes, we had a million dollar deficit in operations, but on top of that, through the general fund, we do have $2.7 million in debt service. And then last, under the expenses of the event center of 2.134 million, there was a total of 1.392 million of operating expenses. <coughs> I think it would be good if there could be a breakdown of what encompasses those operating expenses. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kim Coop. I failed to uh, ask Mr. Harris, but if you'd state your name and your address for the record, that would be helpful. That's okay. No, no, no. Well, I, I did. <laughs> uh, my 
My name is Dr. <coughs> Kim Ko, and I live in 220 South Angola Drive. And I, I'm Mr. Mayor and City Council members and the public. I, well, I understand that this is a local uh, meeting that we're talking about local issues. I do want to say that we do live in a bigger world and that we should be aware of what's going on outside as well. And <coughs> I want to encourage us in the city not to be part of a dangerous trend to another catastrophic war in the Middle East. The money spent on the military should be channeled for public services like education, healthcare, jobs, and housing and unemployment benefits, etc. Instead, trillions goes into the war, into the war machinery, and we see huge cuts in social services and our welfare social uh, safety nets. This country has been in a continuous conflict for the past 20 to 30 years, and it is our young people who cannot find jobs, who ended up being in the military, who will be in the cannon fodder for any kind of future conflicts. The point of it all is that any cuts, any cuts in the social, in the welfare, and in the budget is going to also impact on our city as well as the state. In that spirit, I feel that Rocky Mountain should join with other cities <coughs> and say that we don't want another war. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Samuel Bow. Please you state your name and address for the record. 216 Oak Street. Um, a couple of months ago, a couple of months ago, probably a month ago, um, I'm from Week on Strong area. It was a it was a drive by shooting in front of three O's. Um, there was some kids out there. I don't think nobody got hit, but it was gang violence, usual. We can't be fooling ourselves about this, this gang situation. <coughs> you know, I go through neighborhoods, talk to some of my friends, some older guys. These kids got some big guns. Bigger than the police, young kids. Some of these kids are bullying and tickets. We worry about everything else in Rocky Mountain, but we still not taking care of the street. I was going to move forward with the, the hotel and everything. We got this violence going on. But it ain't nothing. These kids are crying out. They don't have father figures. They don't have role models. So the streets are teaching them. They got some big guns, man. I'm telling you. But it's going to take somebody to get murdered. They're going to shoot the wrong person. And it's going to be war. Because somebody's family's not going to play. They, they're going to get <laughs> It's not going to end. Y'all have the right to put a stop to this. And y'all need to. We're getting out of hand like Durham, North Carolina, and Henderson. 54,000 people here, and we're getting out of hand. Drugs. We got the opioids and the heroin here rocking up. Right there. Kids are taking that and dropping. <coughs> we can't stop it. But it's, it's, it's hitting more than crack in 88, 92. It's here. But we worry about everything else. These people out here losing their kids, their family, and everything to this madness out here. I want to say <coughs> y'all doing a great job in the Hot Street Park, too. You're doing, you're doing a fine job pissing that park up. And the one thing I want to say, I think y'all need cameras in there, cameras out there at these parts. Because you know when you're in a different neighborhood, you got beef with somebody, they will drive by and shoot. But you know, I'm just coming up here speaking what I see every day and how I feel about these kids and these parents that are losing their children. Thank you. Thank you. 
Cunningham. Don't get ready.
snuggling with my husband. Um, but I elect to come down here and ask a question, and I'm sure would appreciate an answer. I think that's so what did you have to do? Currency. Um, also, I was really excited the other week when I saw a letter sign that was an electronic thing, and it was on uh, Tom Betts Highway closer to town, and it said you're being watched or something like that. Um, number one, I would like to know who put that up. Number two, can I get one of those for 301? I'm just so sick and tired of these old sorry chunks that come down the mm. highway and throw crap, mm. I mean, stuff out. And they can put it in their own car. I've got a pretty nice car, and I put junk in my car, but I clean it out every now and then. Um, but I would like a little more progress about litter. Thank you. Some of you people aren't even looking at me. That's not it. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I, and just for the record, <laughs> I, in the last meeting, I actually did try to follow up with a number of people who spoke. Um, but the addresses and the phone numbers were incorrect. So, I mean, it's important <laughs> that that information is there so that we can't follow up. Oh, well, thanks. Thank you. Mayor? May I? Yes, ma'am, please. <laughs> um, Ms. Benjamin says a small group that meets at the, uh, has been meeting at the Dunn Center. We've recently moved to the uh, uh, city's facility on, <laughs> on next to the line, the public works building, I believe. And as a, as a result of the people that attend that and complaints that have been made in efforts to clean up, the representative from DOT who attends that meeting has made it possible to have that sign out there. So it is a DOT sign, and it is moved about from place to place where litter is particularly <laughs> burdensome, whatever. Um, and so you will see that sign in other places. And uh, we should all be watching. And you know, you can write down the tag number, and there are little cards you can get from KB. You can send that card in with the tag number of the person you saw and where and when they were littering, and they'll get a letter from uh, DOT. Uh, Yay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Williams, Bronson Williams. Okay. <laughs> I, I would have an opportunity to look at the city charter, which is the, we'll say the Bible of the city. Uh, and look at the Article 2 of the city charter, Section 2 29. It talks about the rule of order for the city of Rocky Mountain. And that, that brought, I started looking at that when the mayor moved the uh, petition for the public to the other meeting. The charter sets the tone for how the uh, meeting is to be managed and to be governed. If those rules are to be changed, five-sevenths of the elected body is to approve those changes. Uh, while it does provide for the mayor to move or close the public petition meeting or part portion of it and move it to the end for the sake of time, uh, just for no regard, that, that certainly wouldn't, wouldn't mean that. And when you go further down there and, 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 and nine uh, of that same rule, it goes into more detail, but certainly we want to be mindful that the charter is the Bible of the city council, of, of this body. And uh, the other piece is that, of course, we've been coming to city council meetings uh, for a number of years, and I recognize the work that this council uh, has done over the years. Uh, despite uh, social media talks, despite articles and newspapers or, or discussions on television stations, uh, this council has weathered the storm and have made Rocky Mount grow. There is no doubt in my mind that new residents are moving to our city every single year. You can look at utility turnovers in a residential customer base and, and know that to be a fact. Uh, the time that I spent looking at the minutes from the last meeting as it relates to the personnel matter, uh, so those documents are, are online uh, as to what the conversation was in the committee as a whole meeting. Uh, the last city council meeting was in December. Uh, it is important that all seven members of this council uh, take this job seriously and not do it what each person was elected to do. Uh, that is important. And I know that to be a fact uh, for a number of years, again, that, that I've been here. But this is not a show. This is real life solutions or, or, or issues that people need solutions to. Uh, and some matters that oftentimes I hear 
or oftentimes could be rectified or at least spearheaded greatly uh, in some of the empty seats at the school board meetings that I happen to see. Uh, our teachers who are overworked and underpaid uh, deal with children on a day-to-day -day basis. Setting that tone and example of children should be where the community we are falling short at. There's personal responsibility that I believe we all have to encumber ourselves to do if we want the, a better community. It is not just a one man or seven person body who can fix all issues that we have. Some of the issues that we have, we can read out ourselves. My time is up. Well, actually, I have 30 seconds if we get Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Williams, if you could, uh, please give me your address and your name. I mean, you didn't read that at the beginning, just for the record. And, and, and for the record, you have a piece of paper that has it, but 1611 Harbor Street is my address. Thank you. Uh, Ms. O'Reilly? Thank you, Mr.
Pelosi and Jim wouldn't file, file or uh, file. And I want you to know that these five would represent some of the best in the whole Southeast. And we are mighty, mighty proud of them. And uh, if you get a chance on the way out, speak to one of them and thank them for what they do for them. Please fire all of our people, but especially the fire, because we can't replace them on that of Thank you, sir. Thank you.